Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Prague, episode two, featuring my father. <laughs> um, we have uh, Brian and Thiago here, obviously. That was uh, our hosts. We are your hosts, Zoltan, Ryan, Thiago, and this is Talking Prague. And guys, everybody, Ryan, yeah. me and you, one, two, three. Sensei. Bound out to the sensei. Bound out to the sensei. The man of the hour. Yes. All right, Brian. You got the floor. All right. So I am Brian, famous Zoltan's father. And uh, well, I've been playing keyboards in prog band for, I don't know, since 1980, I guess, roughly. Almost, yeah. Yeah. So when, you know, most people start out there. They are at the piano or their parents put them there. My, my parents put me at piano and organ from the time I was like, I think there's pictures of me when I was one year old sitting in a piano. So I don't know what they thought I was going to do with that. Uh, they put my brothers, uh, I have two brothers, they put them there and they gave up by the time they were about 12. Um, but back in 1978, 1979, that's when, you know, I would have been 14 and that's usually about the age where people really get taken into music or really fall in love with it. You know, it's that part of that becoming a teenager, going to high school kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, back just before that, 1977, 1978, there was a lot of really good music that was actually on the radio. So you didn't have to go scouring your way through stuff to learn that these bands existed. So, you know, when I was that age, you know, there would have been Follow You, Follow Me would have been on the radio. And Misunderstanding would have been on the radio. And so you would have heard, and Rush had songs on the radio. Um, and there was also a lot of, um, I guess, you know, sort of bleeding into soft rock. Uh, it seems like from the time that Zoltan and I have been looking at things over the last three or four years, that that seems to have really fallen way out of favor and that if you have melodic kind of soft rock kind of stuff it's like you're i don't know i think it's really like a pop band but there was a real blurring back then right so things like alan parsons and super tramp they, these people called themselves progressive rock bands and now a lot of people would probably call that sort of fancy pop i don't know right uh -huh. Uh, but uh, in right around grade nine, grade 10, that's when you started to discover the other bands, you know, people at school would have them and all of a sudden you'd be at somebody's house and you'd be listening to Yes or Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Yes, and slowly sir. but surely, the more you listen to that, the more you find other people who know those things and then they tell you about another band, right? Yeah. Um, so I would have heard of Van de Graaff by buying the Genesis, what they called the Genesis Bible back then, which was this book that had been written about their career. And then you see that they warmed up for this band. You go, oh, check them out. And they warmed up for uh, another band was on their label, uh, Linda's Farm. And I don't think I ever got any Linda's Farm albums just because uh, I think people described them as sounding like the Beatles. I don't know if you guys ever listened to them, but I don't think I ever tried. But Van de Graaff was supposed to be like kind of the same as Genesis. And, and although they're not, it's definitely in that kind of realm. Um, but anyway, uh, because I had been playing the piano and stuff, and uh, I wanted to actually uh, switch into being a drummer. Yeah. But my best friend was a drummer, and that's the guy who, Rob Leader, who was on the original Kite album, and he was like 50 times better than me. So I went back. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say then that, the, you know, the big, probably the the number one idol that you were really trying to sound, or I was trying to sound like, would have been Tony Banks. Of course. Right. But it's like a song like um, Down and Out. I heard that keyboard intro. Oh, that's when you fall in love with wanting to be a keyboard player. Nice. Right? And there was a couple of other bands that were getting played, maybe because they were in Canada, so you'd hear them. One was a band called FM. Nice. Uh, uh, they played my high school, right? Wow. In 1980, wow. 1981. So I saw them right there with Nash, Nash the Slash. Um, and then the Saga was getting played on, you know, video station and much music or whatever it was. They were getting played. And right. or they were trying to get be sold to the audience. So you'd hear interviews with them and all that stuff. Um, 
So those kind of bands were being the ones that were really pushing me. You know that that was actually a very those keyboard sounds from FM and Saga around 1980 were very they were the modern thing of that day, right? It was moving away from playing a Hammond and a piano and more moving into just all these bands with lots of synthesizers, right? And Saga was really cool because they had like three keyboard players, right? So that's cool. Yeah. And and it was also was very uh, interesting that back then, even if you listened to the music that was on the radio, there was a lot more keyboards. So being a keyboard player could kind of be a, like the cool thing to be. Now yeah. if you're young. I'm not sure you'd want to be the keyboard player because you probably think you're going to be the guy who's going to be in the background. Nobody's ever going to listen to you. To, everybody's mm-hmm. just going to hear the guitar player. Right. Anyway, so we started, uh, you know, my, my as I say, uh, Robert Leader was my best friend since kindergarten. So we would go to his house and then back to my house. And then we'd start getting other guys from the neighborhood. And we were just all doing covers. So we were playing Saga and we'd play Rush and we'd play Genesis in the basement. And we did that all the way through high school. And after high school, I really wanted to get going with, you know, doing the band thing. But as I recall, Robert Leader got a girlfriend and he didn't want drum anymore. (laughs) (laughs) You know what we call that? You know what we call that here? A simp. A A simp. simp. Nowadays, that was what we call him, Brian. So in 1982, 1983, I went searching for a, a band and I found a band that was in Guelph. And they were looking for either a keyboard player or a guitar player or a singer because some people played multiple things and they were willing to sort of Mm -hmm. switch around, right? Um, And even though I only played in this band, I never even think they had a name. It was like six months. Um, So there was a couple of guys from that band that ended up being very important. So one of the guys in that band was Greg Lewis, bass player. And he ended up being our bass player all the way. I don't think we even had any other person as a bass player. Um, mm-hmm. And then the first singer was the singer in that band, Tim Gorman. Um, and he kind of played a little bit of keyboards and he played a little bit of guitar, but he kind of wanted more to focus on trying to do the singing. Mm-hmm. Although when I went to the studio and started playing with him, he was playing. He wasn't singing much. He was just playing keyboards. And the music he was writing would sounded like... Um, Dark Side of the Moon, hmm. yeah, or okay. whatever. Wish you were here. It was these long twenty-five minute songs that hardly had. They weren't complicated. It was all just four-four, but it was moody, right? They play right. Long, right? long, long, long composition. Anyway, that didn't last for very long. Um, some of the guys in the band were not like the drummer and the other guitar player. They weren't that interested in being in a prog band. They didn't right. like this. I was. I started to bring in all the songs. Um, that came became part of that beginning, which is, for example, uh, Baja Chase. Those things were written when I was literally 18 years old. And uh, trying to, uh, I don't know if you hear it when you're listening to the song, but it really was trying to copy Wind and Weathering. Um, ah, I can hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much. My yes. Wind and Weathering ever. Oh, right? Because yeah. I was still, the, I was the Tony Banks fanatic still. So right. that, for the next couple of years, we had, uh, we had another singer come in. Um, And we did demo tapes and we wrote about two albums worth of very, very 70s sounding prog stuff. Of course. And uh, then all of a sudden you you, you wanted to get the idea we're going to get a record deal. But in those days, it's not like today where you have independent people who can just go out and make their own CD or whatever. You needed to get a record deal. Like you couldn't afford to do anything without a record company. And if you went into a record company in 1985 with a 10 minute song that sounded like wind and weathering, I don't think they'd listen to the first minute. <laughs> you yeah, very true, yeah. So you had to try and sound like things that were more eighties. And the only things that I found that were sort of acceptable to my tastes would have been things like 90125. Yes. I mean, that's pretty acceptable. Um, the rush stuff from in the middle eighties, it was still pretty good power windows, stuff like that. And then, you know, there's some more commercial bands, like bands like Toto, which yeah. most of the songs I thought were okay. We could write something like that. It's not too, too far. It's a little bit simpler, but you could do it and you might get some record company interest. Mm-hmm. So we, we got a financer, 
a woman who backed us with a lot of money. I think at one point we had a record contract for, I think, seven million, which in today's dollars would be 15, 20 million. I don't know, something like that. Right. Wow. Not that we ever spent it. I don't think we ever spent more than a million. But still, that's a lot of money. And you can't come up with that money yourself when you work in a factory. Right. But because you're being trying to get into the record business, you need to be forced into being more commercial. Yeah. So anyway, the the second singer finally quit and we replaced him with a guy named Chris Chinchilla. And we went into real studios finally um, and made an entire album on our our own money. And again, in pretty good studios. Um, And then we got involved with uh, Rush producer uh, Terry Brown, who was still, I mean, back then he was still pretty famous. And he had just, he had, just had a number one hit worldwide with, um, never think of the name of the song, but you guys can look it up. You'll know the song. He had one big smash. So he was actually kind of, he was past the rush days, but he was actually a little bit more famous because he'd had this number one song on the radio. Mm-hmm. Um, and he took that album and he took it to uh, Metalworks. I don't know if you guys have heard of Metalworks, but it's it's a it was a very famous studio in Mississauga, which is I part think it told you, I think it told me about that before. But go ahead. Yeah. And uh, we remastered, you know, mastered it again there, and then tried to sh- shop it to record companies, mm-hmm. um, and nobody was the slightest bit interested, of course. <laughs> and then that singer quit. Chris, he, he didn't want to sign any contracts that would mean that he couldn't make a living somehow else. And uh, I just met him just last summer and he's still, I don't know, teaching singing for a right. living. So he's been doing it for whatever that is, 40 years. Um, and then we were shopping all these tapes in, is it uh, some con in France, I think, someplace in France where they have this, where everybody goes to get their European record deals. Right. Mm-hmm. And apparently a Robert Leader, who was the drummer, sat down at a table and on that in that at that table was another guy trying to shop his tapes. And that was Robbie Brennan. And uh, by the time they got back, they said, well, we just our singer just quit. Why don't you come on down? And he came down for one rehearsal and he was in. But that means either you have to redo that entire album or you got to redo a brand new album. So we decided we'd start from scratch again put all the money in, record everything ourselves, And this time everything was done at Metalworks. So it was really, really expensive. Um, and we made the album, which is that first Kite album. And we did get a record deal this time with A&M Records in Canada and Belafon in Germany and Holland, I think. Yeah. And the album right. was released in 1991. Um, we sold about three, four, 5,000 copies. We had a, a top 20 hit on Canadian radio on the um, AOR f- format. I don't know the radio formats anymore, but it's probably still around. That was album-oriented radio, mm-hmm. which really meant all the rock stations. So in Canada, you'd probably don't even have about between 15 and 20 major radio stations, right? Right. Not, a, not that big of a country. So, But still, you're on 17 of the biggest... Uh, you know, radio stations and we had a video, it was getting played in full rotation on much music and we toured up and down the country, played about somewhere between 50 and 100 shows, sometimes warming up for people like um, warmed up for Trooper, warmed up for Glass Tiger, Barney Bentall. Um, I think probably Trooper was the biggest, although Trooper was kind of not really that famous anymore, right? They were kind of on their fading days. Um, and we tried to get a tour across Europe and it fell apart. Yeah. Uh, it was supposed to be with Saga. So there was talks to us touring Germany with Saga. And then I don't know what happened. It just didn't happen. Um, and, you know, you roll into 1992, 1993, and that's when everything just fell apart because, mm-hmm. and you guys know some of the songs because I wrote uh, Trail of Tears, Concrete and Steel. Yep. And starting to get back into being seven minutes, 10 minutes, 11 minutes. And the record company says, no, 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 we're not going to put that out. And I said, <laughs> and then I was like, well, I was 27. 
right? I said, listen, if you guys aren't going to do this stuff, I've been busting my butt at this for a decade. If we're not going to do some prog, I quit. And they said, okay. So once I quit, everybody quit. <laughs> like, basically like over a weekend or something, right? Yeah. Just when mm-hmm. after you had done nine or 10 songs and every single one of them, the record company says, no, we're not, we won't even take you into the studio. Forget it. No. We're not going to let you do that anymore. I went, and I was like, we're not going to write a pop song. So <laughs> there's just nothing left to discuss. So you just, you quit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I went back to university, got a PhD in math and I've worked, uh, now 22, 23, 24 years, mostly in banks in the finance right. industry, doing, uh, building models for credit, credit scores. Right. That's Ari, my specialty. Um, and you know, it wasn't until I guess now three, three and a half years ago, um, you know, Zoltan's always been interested in music, yeah. but it was about three and a half years ago. He probably remembers better than me that he all of a sudden is like, I want to play the drums and you buy me some drums and I'll play. And why don't you sit down and play dad? And I was like, I can't play. I haven't played in 23 years. I've never even touched <laughs> the words. Never. I think that's the time when we got back in touch with uh, Tim Gorman, right? Yeah, I had to get some. I had to get the, that old singer came by and brought some keyboards over for me to play because I didn't have any. I don't, didn't even know if I could sit down and play it. Right. But by the time we finished uh, doing Antediluvian Euphonies, I sort of got the, uh, you know, I got it again. I got it back. I mean, as you're doing each part on the album, you have to go back and listen to your old parts. Yeah. And at first it seemed like they were almost impossible and I wasn't going to be able to play them. But by the time I was done the album, I was like, yeah, I can play all these things. Now that I do it, it doesn't seem so bad. Yeah. Um, and so now Zoltan and I are just, you know, working on a, I think we're, we're basically done another album. We're just doing the uh, mixing, post-production, yeah. right. album cover, stuff like that. Um, and it'll be similar to Antediluvian Newfoundland. just a little bit, I think it's going to be a tiny bit heavier. It's a little bit more polished. And a little bit more polished. Fixed up uh, some technical issues. I think that the first album had a a couple of vocal tracks that were that basically can't be fixed. Yeah. Because they were recorded on basically a crappy mic. You know, mm-hmm. right. it was there and you don't really realize until you're completely done and you're mixing it that – yeah, it could have been a little bit better. I did. I did. It's just, it's just. It's just on Baja Chase here and there. The vocals sound a little bit. Sometimes it sounds like coming through a telephone wire or something. Yeah, that's but the thing. Here right? and there, it's not really everywhere. It doesn't really ruin the mood of the song or anything like that. No, but. no. Yeah, I think that the one other thing is that that uh, if I may interject is that um, antediluvian euphonies, from my perspective, suffers an inconsistency issue, which, to be perfectly fair, I mean, me and my father have discussed at length, and we have agreed that antediluvian euphonies overall is a fairly inconsistent album. When you look at the tracks, the, the, the subgenres that they fit into, it's a fairly inconsistent album. Yeah, but you, you see, um, uh, Zoltan, is that it? there's albums by some progressive rock bands and I'll say somebody like, for example, Rush, where some of their albums, I'm, the songs are very, very similar. Oh and yeah, of course. They, they don't have a ton of variety. And then yeah. you go to the other extreme and some of those early Emerson, Lake and Palmer albums, they switch musical genres yeah. on every song. <laughs> yeah. Can, can yeah, I, can I, can I, can I, can I interject a little bit? Yeah, go if, ahead. You might, if I may. Um, I understand about the whole idea about inconsistency, but as a debut album, for example, you want to show what you're capable of, right? You want to yeah, keep of course. It. For example, you get you have a song like Baja Chase for me, very Tony Banks, and I also get a lot of, I mean, a Lion Mays vibes from that album, believe it or not, especially the earlier works. Uh, and over the, yeah, so over, what? The years, over the years, Lion Mays became in my top two, top three keyboard players. And- and influenced me tons. Right, exactly. Yeah, and then you have a song like, you know, Conquering Steel, very heavy, very like bombastic, and you know, gets very calmed down. And and then you have like some like something like a more of like a ballad, which is uh Endless Night, right? Which I think I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh Brian. It's a very nice song. I like it for like for like a more like 
popish kind of song. I that's my kind of my cup of tea. Yeah. And I don't know if the idea for you guys was like, let's give them a pop song so they record us. I don't know if that was the idea. Because for me, the consistency makes sense for a debut album. Yeah. You want to show what you're capable of in variety, you know? But go ahead. You're 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 talking about uh, antediluvian euphonies, right? Yes, yes. So I mean, this album doesn't have any. There's no record company. I paid for everything. I right. It. So I got all the say that I I wanted. Um, you know, it would be nice if the album was you know 65 minutes long and it was just all these big long songs. But the reality right. is, is that. These songs, like Endless Night is from 1992. Mm -hmm. um, so back then, we were still trying to write something that could get us, uh, not the record deal, because we had the record deal, but would get right. us back to the studio. Right. And from what I recall, the management didn't even like Endless Night. They thought it sucked. Are you serious? Yeah, they didn't like it. They don't have any taste. So <laughs> I don't, I mean, no if, taste. if I'm going to write a poppier song, like I'm going to start to sound like, Alan Parsons, right? Yeah, exactly. That's, that, that's where I, that's my natural taste is if I'm going to write a simpler song, it's going to be kind of like an Alan Parsons kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and the other thing that you know is always mentioning it, but that Baja Chase is written in 1983, Conquering Steel is written in 1992. Of Those course. are nine years apart. Of yeah. course, it's yeah. be, that was a yeah. that's a different writer nine years later. Yeah, that's so right. that, that adds, and then Anti Deluvian Euphonies, the title track. I wrote in 2017. Yeah, of course, of course, mm -hmm. of course. A little bit of a uh, Chinese democracy syndrome. Yeah, I mean, like, uh... years and years and years apart. When bands put albums together, they generally are together, and they're writing the album all within about eight months or a year, right? Yeah, it is. They're going to tend yeah. to then have more consistency because they're all thinking the same way. But when you yeah. take songs that are almost 10 years apart, and one's 30 years apart, of course it's going to sound different, right? Oh, I yeah, completely, yeah. There's no way when I was 25-year-old I would have ever written the song Anti-Deluvian Euphonies. And just... in there, in there are songs like, for example, David, you, you, wrote, you write for an album, but it never made it to that album. And again, mm -hmm. it's going to end up on another album like five years later. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I think they all had, I, I think even like regular pop bands had that issue. Then that song will somehow sound out of place. Yeah. And then yeah, you're going to find out why. The final was like, no, this was written for this previous album. And now it's on this one. I don't know how many months or years later. And like, oh, okay, but it's such a good song. We didn't want to waste it. Yeah, like, might as well sell it. But go yeah. ahead. This um, the new album, Genius Cacophonies, is potentially. Although I don't think Zoltan thinks it will be as inconsistent, but it would still have that potential because the the first half of the album, all those songs are from 1991, 1992, mm -hmm. and then we have this. 25 minute concept piece which goes back all the way back to 82 and 83 right right so again it's the same thing it's like a baja chase kind of thing so it sounds like to me it has different influences like it has more right. old genesis merillion yeah. vibe whereas uh, by 1992 i don't think anybody any of us were listening to merillion at all so we <laughs> not really wasn't. right yeah. it just was a People had moved on to something else, and it just wasn't yeah. that influential. So you don't get that vibe in it. I think I think my uncle was listening to it, but he never told me. I had a talk with him like after I was a grown up, and I was listening to uh, Lavender and Kaylee. He's like, "You listen to Marillion?" I'm like, "Yeah." I'm like, "You know him?" He's like, "Yeah." I'm like, "How come you never told him about it?" I was like, because nobody really cared about that kind of stuff back then. <laughs> you know but what I mean? Yeah, um, so that brings us in to our first subject of the podcast, which is the top three albums for each decade. So I'm going to let my uh, dad uh, start us off here with the with his uh, number one pick for a 70s album. Number one or number three? Uh, let's go with uh, what you think is this, which do you think is the slightly less important than number one. Okay, so I have them ranked for the 70s. And again, it's not necessarily that the album is my extreme favorite, although in this case, it does work that way. But some of it has to be, is, does, is this influential? Yeah. So mm -hmm. for number three, I picked Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's Brain Salad Surgery. Oh. Yes. And I the reason I picked that is because Keith Emerson is 
probably the most famous progressive rock keyboard player ever. And yeah. that's yeah. The, the style he has is the most technically perfect. And he's, he's influenced so many people. He's like the, for prog keyboards, he's like, he's like the Jimi Hendrix. Yes. Right. So I was going to say, yeah. That. yeah. That's most what, definitely. Uh, does only, do you want to go around from here or do you just want me to do number two? Um, number? Uh, you can, uh, we'll, we'll do a, we'll do a round thing where we go uh, each decade one person I, goes in each decade, and then we go around. Should I, should I, should I go there next? Because I'm um, sure. Go ahead. The third, the I'll save. I'll save time because that's why I did a double thumbs up because yeah. that is also my third. I was actually between Tarkus, between Tarkus and that one. Oh yeah, but that's a, personally, that's yeah. But Brain personally, for virtual. yeah, definitely. But um, oh, yeah. Tarkus, the song itself is very iconic for the band. Oh, but the album, but the album falls a little bit shorter than uh, Bedrooms. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. It's more, especially Carnival, you know? Carnival, it's my favorite song. Yeah, my and, favorite ELP song, too. Yeah, Carnival number nine, and it's just... Hey, Carnival my God. And, and, That's and, great. And like, and like, I want to show that never. And like, you said, right, <laughs> and like you said, like, that really, like, made... I, if I was a keyboard player, especially if I grew up in the era that uh, you grew up, I'd be so proud of that type of achievement. <laughs> because like you said, now the keyboard player is some ambience kind of guy that nobody, they don't even care about him. Even the bass player has more importance in popularity, you know, than the keyboard nowadays. Yeah, bass players. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, but everything that have been like three guys, like everybody talks about Rush, even though I love Rush, but those three guys, come on, man. They sound like a freaking a symphony, you know what I mean, together. Yeah, they do. I was very fortunate too because, you know, they got to back together. After breaking up in the late 70s, ELP got yes. back together in the mid 80s. And then they got back together in the early 90s. And both times I saw them, one time I saw them warming up for Jethro Tull. Wow. And one time I saw them on their own. And I got him to see him do all the knives and, you know, the. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, was only, I was like in the fifth row. So it was right there. Yeah. You're going to get thrown at you. Mm hmm. Good Lord. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, I can agree with that. I mean, uh, Carnival, uh, that brain salad surgery is a great album. I mean, you have the entire Carnival Nime suite, you have uh, Jerusalem, yep. you have Dakota, Jerusalem. and I mean, you have uh, Dakota. even Benny the Bouncer. That's a great song. That's a that's a smashing tune. I love Benny it's the a Bouncer. Very, it's a very Man, consistent like album that. quality. <laughs> Such a great, it's a great, great listen, start to finish, and it influenced a lot of different bands. So of course. would agree it's, with that choice. It's a very important album, and I'll completely agree with that. Ryan? All right. Uh, my number three, I put Lark's Tongues in Aspic. Ooh. And not not my Ooh. favorite King Crimson album. Not by a long oh. shot. But I, I would put it as number three, you know, in influence, because I think it was, it brought this very uh, modern classical vibe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this very, like, atonal um, vibe to Prague. It was, it was one of the most eclectic albums Oh. And I think it really influenced people to think outside the box in terms You're of what true. they could do. You really do have a you you have a good point there. I was that that was going to be my uh, I was thinking about that because when you brought up the atonal uh, classical influence, I was thinking, okay, I could put um, you know the power and the glory at number three because now when you yeah. look at it now, I mean that's a huge album. But I went within the court of the Crimson King just because of the fact that it helped popularize the genre. When you look at uh, in in the court of the Crimson King as a release, it really did help bands like Genesis, Yes, and there were a lot of bands that took influence by in the court and just made it their own. So that would have been. That would, that's also a very interesting Definitely. choice. But in the court, right. it is 1969. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> why which is why, <laughs> which is it's why, right I, which is why, it's right which is why I was like, wait, that's 1969. So <laughs> I went ahead and I put um, in the wake of Poseidon because it's a fairly similar album. It's got the same, it uh, the same stuff. I mean. I could agree with you, but I don't think In the Wake has the influence of, no, say, not nearly. Uh, In the Core. And then their other era, their yeah. other 70s era, I think the the influential one was Lark's. Lark's, uh, that or Red. Red for sure. I, more, Red I is, my, is, 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 you know, like my fifth favorite record of all time, but oh, uh, yeah, I so didn't good. think that should, it should, 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 I throw, should I throw, since you guys brought up, yeah. 
Right. Since yeah. you guys brought up red, can I just get out of the way? That'll be my number two. I, w- I was going to go for uh, quarter Kim Soo King, but like, like I said, it's 69 because that yeah. opened up the whole path, especially Mel Brooks. Like that guy, once I heard <sighs> rock music, progressive rock, thrown to the jazz elements and Mel Brooks going off on uh, 21st century's Kitsoid Man, I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, back then, people didn't really do much saxophone and yeah. rock music. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah, and that was the sound of the seventies. Then you got yeah, back the the you had Super Tramp doing right. it. You had everybody exactly. doing it. Exactly. Oh yeah. So yeah, now I'll get out of my way and say that uh, Red is my number two of a most influential because uh, I could have picked Corey Crimson King, but 69. Red is very experimental. Very experimental. Very innocent. Um, very catchy album actually. When you listen to it, very catchy album exactly. And that probably was like, like Ryan saying, like you know, uh, lockers and everything else. It was like, it was a point where King Crimson, when it comes to that consistency of quality music, yeah, you reached the peak and then it starts dying off because you know they broke up and whatever thing, but some members left and whatever. Yeah. But Red for me, hands down, you know. Let me say one two. thing for sure. Let me say one thing. Bill Bruford is going to be on this list twice. Oh, I know. God. <laughs> yeah, same My here. Audience. Same here. Bill My Bruford's man. on the list twice. That, that, that's all right. Yeah, well, it's interesting that uh, we have because uh, I thought number two and number one well, that all four of us were going to pick the exact same thing, but <laughs> yeah. I thought so too. And then Thiago put a curveball. Yeah, so. he did. He's, yeah, he's, he threw us a curveball. So Damn. I think these ones just the two and one are just so obvious. Uh, yeah, number two is close to the edge. Yep. Yes. And yes, that's my number two. I mean, that's my by the pound. That's my number one. <laughs> Not my number two. Yeah. yeah. Um. And number one, Dad. Selling England. Oh, yeah, that's what I have too. It's close yeah, to the edge of selling picks, England. But it's, it's reversed. Man, yeah, fair enough. I mean, the, the Prague archives or whatever. Those two albums are always number one, number two. Fighting for one and two, and yeah, sometimes thick as a brick gets there, or wish yeah. you were here, or whatever. But both of those two albums, uh, Selling England and Close to the Edge, have much more and iconic that. sounds that pretty much everybody's copied since then yeah oh yeah of course yeah. whereas i know right. about and I mean, let me and let, and let me just say and let me just say this what tony banks did in the album okay <sighs> it was nothing like i heard before like, like you could say king crimson added a lot of like a, the moodiness or like um moody blues kind of moodiness and it just mm-hmm. vamped, vamped yeah. it up a little bit but it made it more like a little bit more melancholic and sad now what tony banks did in uh dancing the moonlit night with that whole like core like effects, yes. Uh, 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 uh. It gave me like such a metal. I know you don't like it, but it gave me such a, like a metal, like symphonic metal vibe of yes. darkness. Like I'm like my God, I feel like. Can I say one thing about listening to Genesis? Being before the Genesis was the first prog rock band that I got into after being a prog metal fan, right. which I still am. But you know, listening to that after listening to you know Jordan Rudess, people like that who don't really do all these effects. They do more like the synthy modern sounds and that kind of stuff. Yes, yes. Hearing the Tony Banks with his bag of tones and the way that he plays the keyboards, that was just... Exactly, oh, exactly. It blew your mind away. I mean, blew you my sat mind. there, and Steve you're just like... Let's not, oh, even, not even mention Steve Hackett. You know? Yo, right. God, he, he, you don't he need just to. Knew, he just, right, he just knew how to add the mood. For example, those little licks right off the bat that Steve was doing while uh, 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 Phil <laughs> was calling. <laughs> yeah, da, 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 da. And then you have my man. Ah, ah, ah. I'm like, that song's yeah. perfect. I showed That's I showed great. that album. By the way, by the way, as uh, uh, Brian, my friend Josh was by Ben Ben made. His dad is a drummer. He's a longtime prog fan like yourself. He has wasn't bands and everything. His favorite band is like, yeah, I think I told you, yes. And he never heard the very prog side of like Genesis. More to the pop after no after uh, um, my man left. I keep forgetting. Why why am I forgetting his name? Such iconic, Peter Gabriel. Yeah. Um. So he knows the more popish Genesis, right? And yeah. I showed that entire album to this kid, and this kid, well, he had to almost spark because I'm like, you should yell at your dad for not showing you this album. Yeah. <laughs> he like Paul never showed you this album by Genesis. He's like, bro, my dad never showed me this album. I, I texted him, "You're a bad father. How come <laughs> you never show this kid this?" <laughs> you know what? Like, right, he started right. laughing. Yeah. Yo, go ahead. I'm not so sure now that uh, you know, the pop era of Genesis is as remembered because the people who like that are 
older. There's not a lot of people copying it. So when you talk about Genesis and the context of progressive rock, people do tend to think still about they that will. England. Yes. But back in the 80s and 90s when I was playing, and Genesis was my favorite band, when yeah. you told people that, uh, you know, at a house party or something, they really thought that you were listening to Invisible Touch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, it was really, it had a stigma. And, you know, by the by the time the 1990s rolled around, Phil Collins went from being the most loved to pretty much the most hated because he was so damn overplayed. Yeah, that's yeah. true. He's but, in the top five who just got, at some point in their career, was just saturating the radio, right? Oh, of like, course, of course. They'd, they'd put on five songs and four of them would be from Phil Collins. <laughs> <laughs> no guys here's the uh, thing um by the way uh ryan's Red internet is down so uh let's let's just give him a few seconds to uh, reconnect okay um because but, yeah. i was gonna i was gonna say by my number one but i wait for him to come back because i'll be honest with you guys i yeah. could not decide i'm no. sorry i'm like i came to the conclusion my like should i give one yeah oh man perhaps, okay perhaps i guess i'll do um by the way uh while we wait for uh ryan to come on back um we have this uh very interesting um all of us uh when it comes down to talking about progressive music we are um i feel like we all are on sync with this and welcome back ryan welcome back ryan uh, i guess we're back yes yes so we are Yes. Um. Uh, anyways, uh, to the eighties now. Let's uh, go to the eighties. Okay. Well, did I did I did I say mine though? I didn't say my. Oh wait. First. No. Oh, did you not? Go ahead. No. I, I said it was either. a. Yeah, I said it was a tie between Close to the Edge and Selling England. Okay. But personally, it's a, with a painful heart. I'm gonna go Selling England. Yeah. But Close to the Edge. If I had to like pick another one, same for me. Yeah. Personally. Fair enough. You know, here's why I would put Close to the Edge above Selling England. I think Uh-oh. Close to the Edge, uh, just personally, I prefer the I album. Know. But I think the thing, that, the, the thing that the the thing that I love most about it, I think that's influenced a lot of people, is that it's just a perfect album. It's just three amazing tracks. Holds bar, no killer. I mean, all all no filler, all killer. That's the True. whole thing I like about that album. I think, and I think a lot of those sounds have transcended, you know, into the prog metal scene, to the prog rock scene of the '80s, as well as Genesis. So I think I'm just splitting hairs here, but I would put it slightly above Selling England and Influence, personally. Yeah, right. Um, but I love both albums. Yeah. I, I, so if I may go ahead and start with the '80s, if you guys don't mind, sure. I will go ahead and say this. As much as I think that um, the, their debut is, um, in terms of what was uh, made of it, it was their more popular but i think that the one that actually influenced a lot of bands in the 80s and 90s i actually have to say is probably misplaced childhood not as a script for jester's tear when you listen to uh, misplaced childhood i mean you hear that it was a lot more of a, um, a defined sound rather than trying to be a genesis clone it was really them working together as an actual band and not trying to you know, copy uh, Peter Gabriel, Phil Collins, and, you know, it was a much more clean sound, a much more original sound, and it was the mm-hmm. one, I think, that actually helped them uh, grow more as a band, and that's one album that I see a lot of uh, people citing as a Merlion influence. That was my it's number two. Definitely, yeah, it definitely, it definitely, like, it's a very defining album for them, and it's a very defining album where you have that, um, I'd say, it's like they took that uh pop kind of like sound of genesis yeah. uh-huh. and made yeah. it digestible to the progressive fans yeah kind of that, yeah. you know what i mean like you can take kaylee it's a pop song yeah, but it works through beautifully through. through and through especially through because through. it's accompanied by what um pseudo sick kumano i think that's the name of the song yeah, it's very true. like ambient and you can see the tony banks influence or that na, 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 na. i'm like that's yeah. tony banks but in Marillion format, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's definitely course. like Rotary is very walking much a, hack, you know, right, and, and it's like moving away from Genesis, but still the influence is there, which is where you oh, want to. Yeah, get. of course. You know what I mean? Yeah, of right. course. Completely agree. Go ahead, Dad. So 
So my number three for the eighties was yes. Nine Oh one, two, five. Not bad. Not bad. Um, you know, uh, again, being that I was the kid just starting high school in 1980 and you know, the, the popular press really was glued to the idea that there was punk rock and new wave and all these mm-hmm. old, all these old prog dinosaurs were thankfully all breaking up and we'd never <laughs> have ever again. And Genesis went pop, so we can forget it. And then Yes came out with this album. And actually, if you listen to it from end to end, yeah, Owner of a Lonely Heart is a pretty catchy song, but uh, uh, most of the album's pretty progressive rock. And, you yeah. know, I think it sold about seven, eight million copies or something. And it was huge. At the right. time. Something ridiculous, right. yeah. And so all of a sudden, you know, it was like, Yes is back. Yeah, and of course, I, know, right? I saw that tour, of course. So it might have been my first Yes tour. I'm not quite sure. Because, I mean, awesome. on, on 90125, I mean, you have, uh, you have uh, changes in um, cinema oh. and all of those great pieces. So, yeah, I can completely agree with that. Completely. It's a, it was an 80s prog rock album. Of course. Exactly. It was very, very, quintis- was prog- very, very 80s. Quintis- very quintessential for 80s prog rock. That drum sound. So, oh, yeah. God, yeah. Super 80s. <laughs> and the guitar tone. Oh, God. Oh, Trevor Rabin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Trevor Rabin. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Ryan. Uh, so for my number three, I put uh, Operation Mindcrime by oh. Queensryche. Interesting. So yes. I think undeniably, I don't really like the record all that much. I listened to it. It really didn't draw me in. I think bands like Dream Theater did that sound a lot better. But I think if we really think about it, that was that was the that was the zenith where it became, you know, Rush was doing very heavy riff based prog music, but then you get to a point where you have Queensrÿche. Queensrÿche is the first real progressive metal band. Yeah, so I think just for that reason, they deserve a number three spot, even if I don't like their music all that much. Right, I can see that. Um, right. Anybody has has a comment about that, or should I go ahead? I just remember I listened to it a lot too because by then uh, uh, Robert uh, Leader, the drummer, was becoming a big metal fan. Uh-huh. So he was listening to a lot of Iron Maiden and stuff like that. And, and Queen's Rick, I think, was his probably his favorite band back in that. Right. Was, that and uh, he was also fanatical for all that um, '80s King Crimson stuff. Oh, I love that stuff. Oh, I love yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Discipline is and- one of my favorites. Great and stuff. the thing, the thing also is that Jeff Tate as a vocalist. I mean, this guy, he introduced that whole idea of what would it be like if King Crimson or Rush had like a very operatic Bruce Dickinson style or yeah, no, no, style yeah. singer. Oh, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it was like, oh my god, this is perfect, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, take it's, a it's, take a hold of the perfect. flame. That song is so iconic. Uh, take a hold of the flame. That's that solidified progressive metal right there. That song, yeah. right? Yeah, of and, course. But then Jim like, did it better. Exactly, but they did better. Now, yeah. for me personally, God, the 80s, personally for me anyway, I don't I don't know necessarily uh, uh, out there for the whole, whole, whole world, but Caress of Steel by Rush, number three. Well, that was the 70s. That was, sure, it wasn't the end. That was early no, 70s. That, that was definitely the 70s. That was 75. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, then you know what? Yeah. Moving pick. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Moving picture because that would be my pick. Bad. Because you know what? I got to mention the caress of steel. Yeah. You know why? Even yeah. though it's the 70s, I'll tell you why. Because uh, that would have, if, if we had a fourth to pick, yeah. I would have picked that as a my fourth. I'm, but yeah, yeah. Moving, moving pictures by Russia. Invented Rush progressive metal. The Necromancer is like the first person. The Necromancer, exactly. Right. And um, so I'd say moving pictures. In my um, personal That's opinion. my number one. Uh, I, I, number I'm one is moving just, pictures. Come down. I come down, Zoltan. I know you're going to go in on me. Things. I'm going to think why it's number one. <laughs> I put it as number one because definitely not my favorite Rush record. No. Right. Uh, but it was definitely the one that got people into it. So, you know, with right. that record, you got, you, you know, uh, you had those those great tracks like the camera eye and stuff like that. So people yeah. who were growing up in the 80s, like Mike Portnoy, right. Sean Petrucci, uh, you know, even people like like maybe like Mikhail Al- Ackerfeld. That's how they got Akerfeld, introduced yeah. to the yeah. They got introduced to Rush that way. And, and my, just and for that my, reason, it was such an influential album because it got exactly. everybody into that sound. It was on the radio, but it was a prog record through and through. 
So in- had there not been moving pictures, maybe we won't have, we wouldn't have had Dream Theater or Porcupine Tree or you not know, at all. Or, or, I'll, and, that, and, that's, uh, yeah. and that's my point, real quick, Zoltan. That's my point. The reason I put a number three, even though it could be higher in the sense of influence, is my per- personal taste too. Like I'm going for my personal taste. That's why I put it like all the way back because yeah. mm-hmm. what I see, what he did, is like he got so many people, even though they didn't know yeah. what progressive rock is, the term, the label progressive rock or art yes. rock yeah. or symphonic rock, he got them into that kind of style. Exactly. And from that point on, they ventured to other bands. Yes. Genesis, King Crimson, and early they were open up to yeah. yeah early rush and so, and like Fate's Warning, you know, which is an, just as important in my opinion as Queen's Reich. But yeah, yeah, I think that's I, I think I, that's I, what he did. He pop, he, pop, he helped popularize I, Prague more on moving pictures. I'll um I I would uh, actually somewhat kind of debate that because when you really mm-hmm. think about it, I think that the more important album of the '80s, not moving pictures. Because as much as I think that it's very good, I think that it was more of a commercial friendly album, and it was it definitely right, was. Exactly. You're trying to However, tell me Y Y Z is commercially friendly? That's the only. I think that <laughs> there's a few songs on the album the that are definitely I, not commercially song. friendly. That's- However, I'm gonna say this. I think that the the Rush album, if I absolutely had to have one in in there. I think it would be permanent waves, actually, because you have Spirit of the Ra- Radio all over the radio. Um, Free Will was played all the time, and I, I heard it on the radio all the time. That, I think that Permanent Waves is actually way more important because it was their sound a little bit less radio-friendly, but it really solidified their sound. You had Jacob's Ladder, Entre Noir, and uh, Different Strings, Natural Science. You had all those songs, and that entire album, I would actually say, is more prog and more influential to um, bands than uh, Moving Pictures because... You get uh-huh. to you get to vital signs and that's basically ska at that point. I mean, they're basically they're almost doing reggae there. That was there. new wave. That was almost reggae. I mean, that was almost stinging the police type stuff. Yeah, that's what I was like the police. Yeah, and, that's, because, that's what happens. Only is right around moving pictures. Rush became police fanatics. Yeah, that's the thing. That's why and I'm they, wanted, they wanted to move away from what they were doing and do. And they just yeah. they really loved that sound. That. You know? Yeah, that's why I'm going to go ahead and go on the record and say that moving permanent waves is probably the more influential and the and the one album that I actually see talked about more in Prague than moving pictures. It, yeah, well, I would that's say my that number as, three. As an album, yeah. it's better. It's definitely a better album, and I think it, Prague fans have listened to that album, taken more influence. But if it wasn't for moving pictures, especially in the states, because I guess in Canada probably permanent waves was a oh, more of a commercial huge. smash. Yeah, but over uh, you know, in the United States, definitely, I think moving pictures is more the commercial smash. So I think yeah, for I artists so. like John Petrucci and you know Mike Portnoy, people like that, they you know hearing moving pictures was an important step to getting into the previous other works. I suppose so. Um, I was gonna. Oh, that's why go I think number three. That's why I think it's my number three. It's yeah, not necessarily weird. So a lot of the hard head progressive rock fans is more like. Giving a little nod to the pop yeah. uh, uh, crowd, yeah. But because I can thank them for getting people into the oh, I, I wish I would hear more stuff like this, and then they would find out you know more complex songs, so to speak, and more complex band. So that's yeah. why I picked as yeah. number three. I don't go to as number one, number two at all. But I, I, I definitely put a number three. We go ahead, Zofan. I'm gonna go ahead, and I already know because uh, Dad already said my number two, which was nine zero one two five. I'm gonna go ahead and go right to number one, and I'm gonna go mm-hmm. ahead and say uh, Genesis's Duke is actually their. Uh, it's a very influential album. You had uh, Cul de Sac, um, Hethes, um, even a Behind the Lines was a huge song in Canada. You had a misunderstanding turning on again in thirteen against four. You had yes. even Duke's travels and Duke's end; those were played in Canada as well on the radio as well. And um, all, I think that Duke uh-huh. is by far, as for an '80s album, it's their most important. No one really talks about um, In- Invisible Touch and uh, Mama or Abacab anymore. They they go they gravitate towards Duke now, and I, that's what I've seen with a lot of bands nowadays. Well, They're mentioning Duke as a great album, and they think that it's a prog eighty. It's an eighties prog smash, which I completely agree with. It's my favorite album. From Duke the 80s. is my number two, by the way. Let me just get it out of the way. Then Duke is my number two. Yeah, understand. Definitely number two. My three at this point. Yeah, that. So- yeah, I was just going to say, because, again, I was in high school when these things happened, and uh, 
even among the you know the young crowd who was listening to Genesis albums and Rush albums from the 1970s at the time and it's I don't think it's true now but at the time these albums were kind of like ah oh, disappointing they've become pop you know what right. I mean? it it may have been both of those albums were were albums that uh you know certainly helped them in their career and selling albums yeah but at the time and as i say probably for at least a decade later they were viewed as by by my the generation that was there as being kind of sellouts Right. Uh, yeah. I, but would again, you would you would you say would you say more the more musician prog oriented fans rather than just a regular listener was more like oh they're sellouts. Well, you know, in in 1980 or 1981 when those albums are coming out, I mean, 1975 wasn't that long ago, True. and you could see, see how much, you know, every progressive rock band was either disappearing or going commercial. Yeah, that right. all happened between 1975 mm -hmm. and 1980, 1981. And yep. so, I mean, I love Duke. I've, I've always loved the album. I, I didn't find yeah. it to be uh, as commercial as other people thought it was. But mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys have been online and it's like for, for a lot of the Genesis fanatics, it basically ends around wind and weathering and they just won't listen to anything. And it, <laughs> yeah, right. Because Zoltan got, in, Zoltan got into a, a little bit of a tiff with one place where uh, Genesis site where they were telling him Duke has got no progressive rock to it at all. I don't know what you're talking about. It's a pop album. So th that uh, I'm, I'm uh, tainted by my perspective. Of oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. my, I picked number two is one that no, none of you guys are even going to think of. Uh, you're going to be shocked. I picked uh, Jethro Tull, Crest of a Knave. Oh yeah. I, I picked it because the first Grammy award ever awarded for hard rock, heavy metal, was 1989 and Miguel oh my god Jethro Tull that's stupid that is so stupid though there's so nothing it, hard rock it, about that album it was a big controversy right? oh I imagine it was, it was so. but 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 it's a commentary on how sucky Metallica is compared to them though think about it uh, you so know what I, true you, you know, know what I, here's the thing here's the thing if we're thinking about uh -oh. So, uh, so I, 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 I like the Jethro Tull album, but I, I do also like Injustice for All. And I have to think, what is a, if we're talking I about a hard rock and metal category, album. if you think about the hard rock metal category, what's more equipped to win that category? I would give it to, to Injustice for All. Unfortunately, Injustice for All, but yeah. For me, over, overrated album, Justice for All, for me personally, oh, it is. an overrated, yeah, totally overrated amazing. album, amateurish musicians, amateur Very. production, overly distorted guitars. No variation in vocals, maybe some melodic lines by James, but I mean, yes, when it comes to categories, I would give you the floor, Ryan. But in my perspective as a musician, I'm like, this guy sucks so much compared to Jethro Tull that even though they're not a metal band, bro, you know what? I cannot in my good conscience give Metallica a Grammy and not these guys. <laughs> yeah, I think that that was <laughs> these guys what are happened. true artists. That's what happened, just I making think. noise in comparison. <laughs> they, you know, yeah, no, I would agree, but I, I, I think Jethro Tull should have won the Grammy in the rock category. Right, oh, true. Okay. True. Exactly. That's just yeah, stupid. True. No, yeah, it's, it's a dumb move. Stupid to me. I think it's effective because uh, for people who were probably voting for those at that time, some of them could have been, uh, you know, in their fifties or whatever, and even yeah. me at the time in 1989. And I've never, ever, ever liked Metallica. If you'd have asked me, is what is Metallica? I would have said, that's just noise. And to me, uh, bands like Jethro Tull, that was the rock sound of the 70s. Yeah, they sound like a 70s was. rock. And uh, people probably were voting for them more as a lifetime award. Right. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Because Jethro Tull, was, you, you got to look back at the sales. I mean, Jethro Tull was huge in the early 70s. Oh they yeah, they were. And, if I and, actually and, recall, and let's be honest. And let's be honest. Can I say something? If I actually ahead. recall, I don't even think Ian Anderson showed up to get the Grammy. I don't know. I think they, it's true. Because they, they were like, "Oh, we're, we're not hard rock and <laughs> Yeah, we're not gonna win this. No. <laughs> no, yeah. and, I, and I'll be honest with you too. And I'll be honest with you too. There were so much better bands, metal bands than Metallica. I can think of oh, ten yeah. on top of my head, Iron and I'm Maiden. like. Iron Maiden, Halloween, Queensryche, uh, Fate's Warning. Uh, who else? I mean, Megadeth started there. Black Sabbath. Megadeth was, was that era. They were definitely better musicians. Era. 
and uh, uh, I'm, I don't necessarily would consider Rainbow a metal, but they're very metalish. Dio and Rainbow, Rainbow by, uh, is, is one yeah. of the best. Richard Blackmore, you know? Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Um, so I, think I did all my three picks. I did all I my think. three. I think we can. I can we so move so. on to number? Can we move on to the ninth? Yeah, I, I picked mm -hmm. uh, for number one. I picked the uh, Marillion script for a jester's tear, and yeah, at the time again because I was there, and when you were looking at the underground, Marillion sold like fifteen million albums in the eighties. Yeah, they were right. they were the big underground band that was going to save Prague. Very true. They, they were. were. They were. That's the one people knew, and it was contemporary, and you could go and see them. Yeah. And I've seen them, I think, five times or something. I don't know. Yeah. Really? So here we go. Mine's a misplaced childhood, but go ahead. Since everybody yeah, misplaced childhood. Let's childhood. Go yeah, no, ahead. Misplaced childhood. Yeah. Into the '90s, because this is where I'm going to assume that this was a very hard uh, year for everyone, right? Because. There wasn't a lot this of was... amazing prog then, but... It, it, it Not was... for Dream Theater fans. Hey. Mm. But I'm going to go ahead <laughs> But and... this is a prog metal list. This is for me. Well, they are prog rock, though, but go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and start this off. I'm going to go ahead and say, because I see a lot of bands uh, citing this album as a major influence. For example, I think I even saw Hacken reference this album at least once or twice. Um, Stupid Dream by Porcupine Tree. That was one that I was thinking. I, you know, I love yes. that album. But here's the thing: I was thinking to myself, "Is this the right album for Porcupine Tree in terms of their influence?" Right. Uh, oh, which one did? Which one did you? Which one? I I put number three, Sky Moves Sideways. Oh, very Pink Floyd. Yeah, very Pink Floyd release. I think if we're thinking about their '90s sound, which one was the most influential? I would personally put Sky Moves Sideways. Above. That one. That one for yeah. sure. That one, I think it's a three-way tie because you have the Sky Move Sideways, which was a big one. However, I think that the one that really solidified their space rock sound and one that a lot of people even cite today as an influence was uh, Signify. And same with Stupid Dream. Those are their three most I mean, influential three of the 90s. three great albums. Three, three great albums. So, you know, we yeah. can argue each day which one's more influential than the other. My personal favorite is is Stupid Dream. Of but I, I heard more about people saying, oh, yeah, we like Sky Move Sideways, and the, that influenced us. So Very uh, space that's why rock. Very, Very space, space rock. rock. It's yeah. a Pink Floyd rip, but I love it still. It's a fantastic album, and I'm not going to They were it. supposed to be the new Pink Floyd. I... That's originally what they were that saying. That was, that was, I think that they were even on the on Prog Magazine in the 90s, and they were, they were considered the new Pink Floyd even at, at times. I think they were, they were on the cover one time. Yeah. To a lot of right. to a lot of uh, Steve Stephen was chagrin and anxiety. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fair. Oh, Stephen, Stephen. Stephen. Well, Stephen. did your dad go? Brian, no, he did you not. go? No. Okay, go let him go then. I I couldn't really think of very much because uh, I never listened to any of the the metal oriented prog bands uh -huh. that you might know at that time. I, there's no way I'd ever even heard of Dream Theater. I never even heard right. of them. Wow. Two years ago. That didn't they didn't even exist as far as I know. Right. And exactly. Like I don't think anybody else unless they it, they must have been pretty underground. Like they, they just went unnoticed. So I picked for number three, I picked Rush Counterparts. Um, um because that's def, that's definitely one where they're they abandon all idea of uh trying to be <laughs> prog rock at all. <laughs> and so they were kind of the last holdout that was still trying to be progressive rock you know of the of the bigger older bands yes they were sort of the last one to just say okay we so i pick it for a negative reason which is kind of was that was the end <laughs> yeah it was interesting yeah. interesting choice tiago oh boy i'm a might catch flack for this one uh-oh but the, the reason why i put there because that album was pretty much a progressive rock album not matter in my opinion um, it was not necessarily a strong album at the time when it came out, oh. but it became a strong album that people referenced it a lot. For me personally, anyway, Falling to Infinity by Dream Theater. You um, put that one above Images and Words, Scenes from a Memory. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Two Dream Theater picks. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> that's and, a, and a Symphony X one. Oh, okay, fair enough. My man. Um, I, I think I'm going to change my number three pick. 
<laughs> By the way, because I, I didn't, I forgot about, about because Symphony because X. because I, because, I really yeah, because that album, like for example, if I have to say anything, okay, you got Images and Words, which was a mixed bag of progressive rock and you know very rushy tunes with some metal like Queens Rack and Fates Warning. It was a mixed bag. Awake is pretty much in the same metal. venue, but more metal, seven string in there and everything. And then Change of Seasons was really an AP, so I don't AP, count yeah. that much. An AP, and uh, then before. The my number one, oh, <laughs> yeah. falling to falling to infinity, which was more definitely a more prog oriented. Even some it pop songs in there. I think and my was... favorite song, and my favorite song, which is not even in the album, which was meant called "Raise the Knife," which I love that song, which didn't make one. to the album, should have made to the album, but through over and through Annalee. that is a pro- yeah over Annalee. Yeah. and through and through I'm that was a progressive story. rock album through and through. I don't hear any metal in there. Eh, uh, that's moments, debatable. Like, that's very. There's debatable. a couple of moments, are, but little nods. Like, I, like I don't that, consider that something first metal. song that one that goes. Da, 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 well, we have Peruvian skies, which is Peruvian like skies everybody loves very... Peruvian skies, but I'm like it's, it's the first a Metallica. Song the album. I really like the groove. It's like goes. Da, 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 right, da, right, da, da. <laughs> right. Like, but through and through the album by itself, ninety percent of the album is pretty progressive rock, and that's my yeah. I could, I could agree with that. I um I was um by the way I I should have made this a bit more clear maybe I I thought maybe it would be a little bit on the nose to have two albums by the same band I think that might have been a little bit of a weird idea but I was gonna do two Dream Theater albums but I decided against it I yeah I don't have any but there's a I, loophole around my pick I don't have any um, me too number, number two is Hybris by Anglegard. That was the uh, album that really brought back the symphonic prog sound, and it yeah. it helped revive that idea of re re um, rehashing the great moments of symphonic prog in the '90s and mm-hmm. uh, of the '70s and bringing it into the '90s as a more modern sound and giving it a little bit more of an angular feel while also remaining such an influential album. Now, right now, where did Thiago go? No, I'm right here. I'm just uh, telling people not Amazon. to message me. Yeah, I'm right. telling people not to message me because I'm okay. in the middle. Fair enough. That... Number two pick for oh. me. Oh, no. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, number two pick for me was actually not a Dream Theater record. It was Liquid Tension Experiment 2. Ooh. Interesting the reason why pick. I picked Liquid Tension Experiment uh, is because I think that album, especially if you're thinking about what the prog scene has transformed into, in you know the 2010s it's become very much a guitar scene so this album is very much just very technical music a lot of notes a lot of you know a lot of very fast passages like it it is it is just dream theater without the vocals and then the technique turned up the 10 you even had tony levin on bass to solidify that that whole sound so i think as a record if you think about how it's influenced guitar players and keyboard players now in the the prog sphere in the in the 2010s it's it's a clear choice i think yeah um i can see that if but if um if we were allowed to go ahead and say uh the 2010 the 2000s and the 2000s uh nowadays i would actually go ahead and say that their newest liquid tension experiment album is my favorite the newest the 2007 one the liquid trio yeah that's i think that's my favorite probably the worst (laughs) I love I, it. It's it's I think most I people know, agree on it. Bro, who likes Liquid Trio? I quite enjoyed it. It was like um it has no Petrucci on it. How you gonna I have don't Liquid Tension without Petrucci? It was more for me, it was more of like the uh ELP Diago? kind of uh, it was like the ELP standard, you, uh, my, but brought is it, it. Is it time for the katana? Is, is it time for the katana? I'll be right back, guys. <laughs> I'm not saying I don't like the early Liquid Tension, but I'm gonna say this: I like, I really do enjoy Liquid Trio. All right, that's a hot take. Very, because I mean, I like the the Emerson, Lake, and Palmer format of that album. Yeah. And frankly, I mean, I always I wanna, thought he needed a guitar player. But that might be just that would, me. That would, that would have been Hendrix. Talking. Hendrix was supposed to join ELP. I heard about that. Hendrix was supposed to join ELP, which I don't think would have been a good move. But I mean, hey, if they, if they actually signed him in, the band would have been named Help. Oh, no. <laughs> so also, one thing I would like to mention is I think Richie Blackmore and ELP would have been amazing. 
That would have been interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, he, he's, that that he is the my Keith favorite guitarist. Emerson. He is the Keith Emerson of guitar. With that classical see. vibe. Very technical for the 70s. He is, you know, yeah. I think he would have done Zoltan. a lot of great things with that band. Uh, Zoltan, you earned, your, you earned yourself a slice for that one. On the oh, trio. <laughs> Just saying. I'm sticking by you. I'm sticking by what I said. Oh, uh, yeah. Keep going. Keep doing. Um, <laughs> keep doing that. Counting your sins. Okay, did, did, did Brian go for his number two? Yes, he did. Uh, I would pick. Let, let me pick one then. Go ahead. Number two. Divine Wings of Tragedy Symphony Act. Ooh. Yeah, I was I was debating that one, but I think <sighs> the album <laughs> that's brought more, in my opinion, was always The Odyssey. I didn't feel right putting it in the 90s. Well, The Odyssey is 2000, though. Yeah, that's what but I'm that's saying. I feel though. right putting it in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, that, that, yeah, exactly. You're right. You're right. Yeah, Divine Wings are tragic, yeah. hands down for me. But go ahead. Uh, whatever. Phenomenal album. Dad? Yeah, well, I some of the, a lot of these bands that you guys are talking about, I never, I've never heard any of them. So, right. Well, well like, Symphony X is more like is more like a Queen's Rite going more like you know two point oh. Yeah, so I'm kind of like more instrumental. Right, exactly. Dio, Dio with Queen's Rite. Go ahead. And heavier, with a tree, with an orchestra. Pretty with an much. Orchestra. I picked a uh, flower king. Stardust. We are as number two. Uh, uh, I can see that. I can see that. It's a Definitely. good one. Definitely, one hundred percent. Have you listened to it yet, Ryan? No, dude. It's like two hours I did. long. It's, it's still super good. I, I, I'm I sure it's it. super good, but I need to set down two hours. Yeah, yeah of course. Go on, Dad. Sorry. Says the guy that probably watched like Dream Theater three hours and a half long videos and DVDs. Well, that's the thing. I was already into Dream Theater, so <laughs> if you want to introduce somebody to Dream Theater, you wouldn't give them the you know you wouldn't give them the longest Dream Theater live album. You'd give us no, you give them like images and words because it's short. I guess so. Anyways, go on, Dad, well, please. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. So for number one, I picked the Anglegard Hybris. Yeah. I, I think it was very. Yet. It's very well known, sort of in the underground, yes. back to traditional kind of. Let's 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 get the uh, flutes out and get the mellotrons out and all that kind of stuff, and it's let's so, go. I agree so, with you. Seventy-one. That's where Prague should continue going. And even if it's not, I don't know because it, it's. I'm not certain it's a a really really great album. I think it's good, it's really but it definitely good. has that bang of yeah we can still do that exactly exactly the flute so we can do that yeah, and a lot of, of us copied it right yeah of course of course of course a lot of um influence from it yeah i i'm gonna go ahead and say that my number one is stardust we are because it was definitely the most well-known album it's the one that brought the symphonic prog scene really it it helped open up more gateways as well when you think of it historically, I mean, a lot of bands nowadays think, when they think of uh, Flower Kings as Stardust We Are, and of course, that is their staple album. That's the album where they so they solidified their sound, they perfected each song to a T, and they made sure that there was absolutely no filler. It was an all-killer, no-filler album. You're telling me, you put... I, I, I think the Flower Kings are probably I... a great band, but in terms of influence... If we're thinking about influence, you would put the Flower Kings above Dream Theater I, or Symphony X. I was. Uh, or even an Opeth album like Still Life. Even, oh, exactly. crap! I could have put Still Life or uh, My Arms Rehearse in there, but I think that when it comes down to it, you can hear because you you look at them now. The Flower Kings are a lot bigger now than they were back in the '90s. They are way I bigger. Agree. They are. So, they so they Opeth, got a lot yeah. of sales. They got a lot of sales in in Sweden and Italy and and um and in um even in Germany. I mean, we got. I mean, even mm -hmm. in Canada. I mean, uh, some of their newer songs have actually made it onto the radio, and and now uh, the Flower Kings are actually making it to more of a mainstream. They're getting more well known, and they're making they're making profit now, and and I think that they're starting to become a very influential prog band, even of the now. Yeah, like I would. One I of the still reasons... wouldn't put them up. I right, wouldn't put them exactly. Dream Theater Opeth and Influence. You might like them more, which is perfectly fine. But I don't know if I could realistically say that but they've had th more this influence. Is, this, this is what this is why, but for my number two, I had to pick like 
Symphony X, because while I do love the Flower Kings and Stardust Who Are is a beautiful album, in my opinion. I listened to the two hours, by the way, Ryan. <laughs> okay. And um, <laughs> I made it. I first? did it. Was it your first? No, no, no. Wait, wait, hold on. But I say, I say this, just a, a little comment. The reason why I picked Divine Wings of Tragedy for number two before my number one, I was going to pick that for Flower Kings for number two. But yeah. then I decided against it for Divine Wings of, of, of Tragedy because... He pushed, he helped push the prog rock metal. It's the symphonic. He added more elements to the, of the of symphony to an already an established genre. They already already had those elements. Yeah, of course. Um, of classical music, so to speak, and violins and violas, yeah. and it sound like they, they made it sound like epic movie sagas, like Lord of the Rings. That's yeah. what drew me a lot. Like it sounds like a it sounds like a, a Lord of the Rings composition gone prog. Or Iliad, you know? That's how they sound to me. So that's yeah. why I picked them above Flower Kings. Now, for my number one, of course, I think Ryan, I think that's your we're gonna, number we're one. We're going to talk about the same album, right? Scenes right. of a Memory. Scenes of a Memory, Amy. Let because me just say, Opeth, memory. Everybody, everybody says that. Like, that's the album that kind of got me to Prague. Opeth, Michael Akerfeld, like, they love King Crimson and all this stuff, but that's what made him, like... Scenes from a Memory, yeah. It bridged yeah. that gap. You, you have these the gap. fans. For me as well, too. I was a metal fan. I was listening to Metallica right. and Iron Maiden. Uh, but then I heard Dream Theater and I was like, this is what I've been looking for the whole time. I didn't know exactly. that what I wanted was prog. I would listen to those metal bands and I'd be like, yeah, I like those melodic sections and I like the longer songs. And I didn't know what I was looking for until I found Dream exactly. Theater and it really inspired me. But beyond that, I think it is it is a 10 out of 10 record. I think as a concept it record. Is. It flows beautifully. I think there's there's heavy moments. There's also very somber moments, very beautiful moments on that record. The and it was the defining moment for Prague it again. With it. it was like, it like, was the moment. It was the moment. It was it was the close to the edge in a sense of of another generation. I will say this: like Prague died an ugly death in the '90s, especially because of grunge or glam rock in the '80s, right? Glam yeah, rock yeah. in the '80s. Yeah. Like, like, came and out. And it died. Oh, and grunge came, seven, and grunge. It was not. Right, and then when you got to like seen some of memory, it was like that third day resurrection for prog yes. music in general. Yeah. It's a progressive music as a genre. I'm sorry, and, I have and to then say. Dream Theater, as we know, is a commercial force. Right, yeah, they've sold like 20, 30 million records. And look, and, and, and look they're, what they're they the did. They, it, right now. it was so. a do or die. It was a do or die album. The guys wanted to give up. They wanted to do Bon Jovi songs like the labels are selling them to do. And yeah. Mike Portnoy. You know, he I thank no. that man from the bottom of my heart because it said, screw this shit. I'm out of the band. If we're going to be playing shitty music yeah. that we don't love, I'm out of the band. I want to play progressive music. All right. We guys together. Okay. Tell the studio, tell the label to get the, the hell out of the way. Let's go record it. Do or die. Let's do a live DVD. If it sells itself and not, I go back delivering Chinese food or whatever he was doing back then. <laughs> That's what he was doing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Chinese food. So, no, you know, yeah. and, uh, so and then it for, saved the career, and that's when like Opeth and Porcupine Tree were really growing too, and yeah. the rest is history from there. You know what I mean? Now we have Hacken and all them guys. Like, yeah, we think there, would, there would be no Hacken. There would no, be no not at all. Periphery, no, you know, any of all these bands. For, no, for, for Brian fact. who hasn't listened to it, it's very much like it's like the Lamb Lies Down, but then you mix like Iron Maiden. That's yep. how I would kind of describe the album. It's a beautiful Pretty album, much. just like the Lamb. Right. That's kind of how it how it good description of it so um we have finally come to a close on our <laughs> on our decades of prog so we're going to move on to the suggested uh, subject from my father thank you very much we are going to be discussing our 10 favorite bands of all time wow okay um so dad <laughs> why not you start us off you you do, you want to go around 10 and then go around nine or you just want to go through a few of them um, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do a rotation. We're, we're gonna go a rotation. You, Should Ryan, Thiago. Uh, um, I don't think that has any. <laughs> Maybe. Do you have any? I know I don't. Okay, so okay. um, I guess anyone who wants uh, honorable mentions can go ahead and. I have two honorable mentions, mentions for for top ten prog bands. Uh, so the two that didn't make it in were Camel and Porcupine Tree. Oh, hot take on that. That's a hot you know, take on Camel. There, it's just bands I prefer. I under, I understand that. Actually, Porcupine you know, trees are inconsistent to me. They're very inconsistent too. I, there's like they do they do a great album and then they like kind of like eh. the patch mode, the whole thing. 
You gotta listen to more Camel, yeah. man. You gotta listen to more. I've listened to like four Camel albums at this That's point. That's not enough. Put them in my top ten. That's exactly. Right, I wouldn't, exactly. Put, them in my, I wouldn't exactly. put them in my top ten. I, I the the ten bands that I have on on the list, I've done the full discography, so I didn't feel yeah. it was on. I didn't feel it was fair. Yeah, yet, of course, of course, to of course. put them on the list. Whereas the other ten, like my number ten choice, I don't like. Like I like the Camel albums more. But it wouldn't right. feel fair to put them on the list because I haven't done their discography yet. Porky well, Pine I mean, definitely not going to be in the top ten, but I do ooh. love them, and I still yeah, I felt it was necessary to mention them. Good. Yeah, my 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 my, my camel camel is definitely one of them because especially because oh. I love the I can see your home from your house from here album. I do love Stationary Traveler. I yeah. do love uh, Snow Goose. Snow yeah. Goose is amazing. I love all these albums. I love them, yeah. and but at the same token. It's just like it's it's it. I don't mean to sound unfair, but it's like a Pink Floyd going more a little bit more symphonic, and more focused on instruments. Yeah, and yeah. like in some ways, I like the instrumentals way better than Pink Floyd. Like I will listen to Pink oh, Floyd for the yeah. lyrics. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but like I said, that's an honorable mention for me as well. Porcupine Tree as well, and man, I venture to say Saga, even though Saga is a great band. But personally, yeah. for me. They influence me as much, so I'd say Saga as well, even though they're great. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got another honorable mention. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Marillion. Yeah. Marillion, yeah. Yeah. You know, as much as I love yeah. Marillion, I think they have about like four or five albums that I really like, which would be like Clutching at Straws, yeah. This Place Childhood, yeah. you know, Fugazi, Season's End, uh, exactly. Script for, Jester, for Jester's Tear. And then they get kind of boring. Like they people do. were telling me, listen to Brave, listen to Brave, and I was like, I listened to it, and I'm like, yeah. So if I may go ahead and bring in my honorable mentions, unfortunately, and I know that you two, you Dream two Peter's specifically, um, I unfortunately couldn't even put them in the top three honorable mentions. <gasps> I'm going to say that my number eleven would probably be Symphony X. You put I, Symphony X about Dream Theater. Unfortunately, yes. However, my number twelve, I'm gonna go ahead and say Aerith. I do, I do know, I do know because Zoltan's more into the symphonic style. I am. Uh, I, I actually, I'm gonna go ahead and say that um, the uh, Human Equation, um, the Theory of Everything, those are in my top forty-two albums of all time. So Arian's got to be in my number twelve as well. And mm -hmm. uh, number thirteen, I'm all, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, point this out. And this might actually be shocking, but uh -huh. uh, just for the sake of it, I'll go ahead and say that. I think that's it. Actually, I think that's. that's I think all I, I have one. I have one more honorable mention. To be fair, one more. Um, my yeah. another one would be Fate's Warning. Uh, yeah. Fate's yes. Warning. It's again yes, another yes, band yes. that I haven't of... done the full discography. Pleasant Shade of Grey. So I felt album. it was yeah. Pleasant Shade of Grey, Perfect Symmetry, um, Sweet, Disconnected. Disconnected. I've listened to those three albums only, uh, mm. and I love them. I would give them, you know, either nine or ten, or or I think I would give Pleasant Shade of Grey a ten. Theories I, of I Flight is also record. a great album. Theories I've of heard. Flight. But I, I just cannot put them as a in the top ten because it's the same reason as Camel. I haven't done the full discography yet, you know. Yes. So, Dad, start us off. What's your number ten? Uh, Pink Floyd. Ah, very interesting. Um, what, uh, reasons? Certainly for the certainly for the the big concept albums. I mean, you know, <laughs> Dark Side of the Moon and the Wall. It's very that's and, and and the huge commercial success that they managed to get a lot of people to come over to that kind of music without, you know, having to do, you know, and the show too. I mean, the idea they're, you know, one of the most famous known bands ever for that huge show. I mean, as Zoltan and I went and yes. see the band from, uh, what was it called? Brit Floyd. Yeah. The Austra and we saw the Australian Pink Floyd show. So we got a chance to see sort of the pulse type tour and it was, yeah. it was crazy. It was such an atmosphere you know, to go back and, and I never, I've never seen Pink Floyd. I never seen them in the day for some reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so Pink Floyd. Brian? Me? Yeah. Uh, my number 10 is uh, Symphony X. Ooh. Symphony X is a great band. I just feel that, um, and they're one of my favorites. Um, definitely, they have a lot of great albums. Divine Wings of Tragedy, 
yeah. Five, the new mythology suite. Um, yeah. Odyssey. The Odyssey. You know, yeah. uh, Twilight and Olympus. They have a lot of great albums, but I think their one issue that keeps them from being higher up on this list, even though I love their sound, their yeah. singular sound, is because they just do the same thing for like most of their albums. True. It, Very true. It, to me, it just seems like it's a heavy D minor riff, the harmonic minor riff. Yeah. They do this like instrumental orchestral opening thing. Then they do like a melodic section. Then it gets really heavy. Then they trade off the Ingve style, like guitar, keyboard, guitar, yes, keyboard, solo. Exactly. Then they go back, they do old. another chords. So it just gets old. So I, I cannot listen old. to Symphony X that much because True. I listen to one album and I can't do another album right afterwards because I'm like, Fair do enough. I want to listen to the same album again? Yeah. But I, I do love their what they do. I think yep. what they do is awesome. I just think that they didn't Symphon- have the depth of other right. rock. They haven't perfected it just yet. Right. To be honest and with you guys, will. right, exactly. It's too late for them, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, Symphony X is probably staying my honorable mentions. They almost made it to the list, but because of that very same element that you just described, Ryan, is why even though they have created gr- great classical compositions inside Progressive, but yeah, the, the genre, but 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 at the same time, like you said, is the same formula. It's like, it's progressive, but at the same time, your next album, I know what to expect. Yeah, well, not anymore. They done, they're doing the groove. Not anymore. Thing. Yeah, right, right. But, but talking about the 90s okay, so, and 2000s. Right. So, okay, so the honorable mention. Uh, I wish I could put these guys a little bit above because of Arian Lukasen, but I'm going to have to put them at my 10. It would be Arian. Especially uh, because of Arian number 10. Yeah. Oh, no, my God. Yeah. You know. I was I was almost gonna put Pain and Salvation, but I'm like, no, I like prefer Arian than Pain and Salvation. I'm gonna put Arian there, and the Human Equation. Like I, I was telling Zoltan about, it. Zoltan loved it. It's like, dude, that album is fantastic, and oh, beautiful. That's album. that's one of the that's one of the albums. To be honest with you guys, is when I listen to it, it actually it actually what gave inspired me a lot to go back to the past because Arian has a lot of that, you know, gentle toll. Genesis, King Crimson element with the flute and everything, the whole folky, you know, pastoral kind of like sounds. And then they uh-huh. throw in the metal. Yeah. You know, they throw in the epics. They throw in the, even the, like the kind of Symphony X kind of stuff. So it's a good mishmash of what made me be like, oh my God, a lot of my favorite bands don't do this kind of sound. That doesn't, they don't yeah. do this kind of sound anymore. And then that's when I saw Arian Lucas talking about the bands that influenced him. And I saw like Jet Pro and all the other guys. I'm like, I got to go back and listen to those guys then. So I put them yeah. number 10 because of that. They introduced me to the past. They, they, they're the ones that actually helped me look more to the past bands of progressive music. And that's when I got into Jet Pro. I heard about them, but I was like thick as a brick. That's the first thing I saw. Yeah. Like, holy crap. Great introduction. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, right yeah, the right on, I, 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 I YouTube Jethro Tull, thick as a brick, the whole freaking epic thing. I'm like, oh, oh. my God. Part 20 minutes? Okay, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But go ahead, I'll go ahead. Next, guys. Go ahead. I am Good going to, I, my number 10 is UK. And uh, the only reason why I didn't put them higher is because they only have two albums. But the True. thing is, is that those two albums are so unbelievably perfect that they didn't they didn't really need any more albums. Actually, I think that if they released another album, it could have actually hurt their they could have hurt their sound. Yes. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that they are the perfect supergroup. You have Eddie Jobson, who is, in my honest opinion, and I know I'm gonna get a little bit of flack for this, but I actually prefer. You Eddie always Jobson. say that. I always prefer You're Eddie. Jobson. apart for this. I prefer Eddie Jobson's sound over Keith Emerson's. I prefer Eddie Jobson. He's got the. He's got this Eddie Jobson like classical side, but he's more melodic, a little bit more feeling, and. You have Alan Holdsworth, who obviously he's a he's a, a guitarist who you have to praise. A legend. He's a living. He he is um he is a legend. Not a living um, legend. Unfortunately, uh, Bill Bruford, fantastic drummer, and John Wetton, great vocal vocalist oh, and bassist. So I would, I would. Yeah. That's it. I keep I keep I keep trying to interrupt. It's okay. Uh, I I would say that they're the cream of Prague, just the yes. perfect supergroup. Just, they are. Just, they was like the Avengers, just getting all the you know 
Yeah. yeah. The, all yeah. the right people in the right room together. By the way, if I absolutely had to make any more honorable mentions, I would have to say that my honorable mentions would be probably um, probably Transatlantic and Spock's Beard. Those are my two other honorable mentions. Oh, I didn't mention my honorable mentions. Riverside. Oh, yeah. Um, Riverside. Another band too. that I have not finished their discography. So I, was, um, I just said. You know yeah. what? You know what? You know what I'm going to do? I put, yeah. I'm probably going to put all my honorable mentions in the comment sessions after this because we can yeah. go here forever. Yeah. But go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Dad, yeah. Dad number nine. Uh, I went with uh, Rush. Oh, okay. good band. Uh, good band. Probably good placement. I think, I think that when Rush did great progressive rock, rock albums, they were really, really were great, but unfortunately, it's probably only about ten percent of their career. Yeah, and true. It's like you know, maybe Caress of Steel, and then by Moving Pictures, you're definitely not you're heading out. Right? Yeah, true. that's true. From then on, I don't think they're. I mean, so basically, since 1981, 1982, they haven't made a single progressive rock album. So, I wish they'd have done more of that. I think uh, um, lots of. Lots of the other albums after that, they really do start to sound like interchangeable. Like, you know, it's like eight albums that probably you could have got two good albums out of it. Lots I think of that, Yeah. I think that you could go ahead and say that the arguable albums that are still progressive rock and rush type sounds, I think that the ones that are very arguable are Power Windows and Presto. I think that those are the two arguable albums that have the best prog um, material. What about uh, Grace, Grace under latest pressure. one? Oh, um, the last one they did. What's Clockwork Angels is Clockwork not Angel bad. Is I don't remember it. Mm -hmm. I don't remember a thing. It's about a heavy it. prog album. It is. It is definitely very riff oriented, very progressive. It, it was a return um, to form. It, to a it degree. was, but I think that um, the last one that I can actually say, and this might be even pushing it a little bit, um, are um, maybe even Hold Your Fire and uh, Grace Under Pressure are the uh, ones mm -hmm. that you could considerably have some uh, progressive elements that are really good in there as well. But I think, I think, right. I think as, as Brian says, it's very much, you know, after moving pictures, they were done. They weren't, uh, yeah. they weren't the same yeah. band anymore. Of course. In of my course. opinion. Totally agree. To be honest, to be honest, just to get out of the way, now that Brian has mentioned Rush, I guess I got the same one too for number nine, because I'll, that's in similar reasons and also because um while rush started strong while they helped popular popularize the genre they did a lot for progressive music but at the end of the day they overall are more like a rock band more than a progressive rock band and yep. we're, we're talking about prog here so we have to put bands who are more consistently progressive Versus, yeah. like Rob Bryan said, when your career is only ten percent progressive, yeah, um, you don't really deserve that spot. Even though I do love them, let me get that yeah. out of the way because I'm going to get heat probably in the comments. Yeah, uh -huh. I do love each individual member of that band. They huge influences on me, especially lyric wise, uh, 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 concept wise. The fact that you know, they only three guys juggling, they juggling huge. between. And they sound huge. They sound huge. You, you cannot take anything away from them I mean, because they influence a lot of people to do to follow suit, right? Yeah. But at the same time, at the same token, like Brian said, when it comes to progressive music itself, I wish they did more. So yeah. number nine yeah. as well. I, I took that into account, but I just put, like if, if we're thinking about their progressive albums, that's how I judge this. If I'm thinking about mm -hmm. the progressive albums, how much do I like them? How much do... Does some other material make me feel? Because then, you know, I, I would feel I would probably put Genesis up, like not even on the list if I was taking Ooh. into account their not good albums. You know what I mean? I guess so. I understand. So I just put like, how do their amazing albums make me feel? Compare exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, the way the way I see it is though my I guess my, my difference is the consistency of progressive yeah. albums versus that, that's true. Although that's other, cool. other, other, otherwise, personally. Rush should be like personally for me if I had not to go there. Like Rush is definitely like amongst my favorite bands of all time. So yeah, favorite yeah. bands of all time for me too. Yeah, um, go ahead. Can I go in my number nine? Yeah, my number on. nine is Opeth. Oh, good pick. But good pick. It, I think it's a good placement for Opeth. I don't. For me, they've influenced my writing quite a lot. That's yes. for sure. Uh, just the mm -hmm. melding of the dynamics that they have, where it's super heavy and then it's very melodic. Yeah. Acrofelt 
is is just a genius. He's an incredible singer. He's a very melodic guitar player. He's an incredible mm. composer. Um, yeah. He's he's a visionary, and I think his music reflects that. I think his music, you know, really was able to meld very very heavy sounds, but with also this very retro prog vibe. And I'm not one of those people that 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 just likes one specific era of Opeth. I love I love stuff like Morning Rise. I've looked mm-hmm. back on that and I've liked that record a lot. And I love I did know, too. Even up to the new record in Cod of Venom. Um, so I, I think they're just a very consistent, very very great progressive band uh, that's influenced me as a lot as a writer for sure. Um, yeah, okay, I'll go ahead and say my number nine, which is also Rush, for the same reasons as all of you guys brought in. So, Dad, number right. eight. <laughs> wow. Number eight, uh, Jethro Tull. Ah, very Jethro nice. Ah. But, nice uh, again, some of this some of this stuff is uh, generational, you know? I mean, I, I, see, I saw Jethro Tull probably, I don't know, maybe even ten times in the 80s. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and into the nineties. And so, I mean, I was fanatical for them for quite a long time. Yeah. Right. yeah. They, they have a, um, a little bit more consistently stayed in the, um, prog rock genre for at least through the entire decade of the seventies, even mm-hmm. a storm watch. I think, I still think that's pretty much a progressive rock album. I so they got, you know, they got seven, eight, nine that you could arguably say are pretty solidly good prog albums. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan. My number eight is um, Pink Floyd. Ooh, interesting. Go ahead. What about you, Zoli? Um, um, uh, Ryan, did, it, did, it, did he get disconnected? I think he did. Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd. Uh, thing. Oh, okay. There we go. Go ahead, Ryan. Let me actually connect to a different internet real quick. Yeah, please, because you're 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 uh, fading in and out. Okay. Um, there we go. Everything's back, and now there you I go. Pro- the Sorry, camera quality is probably better now. Uh, yeah, stay yeah, your reasons it's now. Better. Okay. Um, because I was on a backup internet before. Okay. Now my normal internet is back. So number eight, Pink Floyd. Um, I love about fifty percent of the records. I love. Um, Dark Side of the Moon, very influential for me. I think I've I've told this story to Zoltan and Thiago that yeah. before I listened to that record, I just would listen to songs. And I remember my dad got me that record for like my 15th birthday. Yeah. And I just put it on and I realized I listened to it start to finish on vinyl. And I said, This is like it's it, it was an I realized the art of making a record. Yeah. You know, start to finish, creating a piece of cohesive music that you release. That you don't just listen to one song off. You don't just listen to the single. You yeah. listen to every single song start to finish, and it flows beautifully. Yeah, so the, I think just for that reason, how much of it's influenced me as a music listener and as a writer, it deserves a spot. But I, we have to talk about their other records. Animals, hugely influential. One of my favorites. Same. Uh, yeah. Wish you were here. Um, metal, um, and they did transition into more. It pop stuff and I, I wasn't a big fan of the wall but i think overall we have to look in in my case of how much it's influenced me as a music listener and a writer and it's it's an unprecedented influence for sure yeah tiago this was a hard choice for me because pink floyd i would just get out of the way didn't make the list yes yeah, you could have but personally for me I grew up listening to a lot of Pink Floyd when I was growing up. Uh, my mom's mm-hmm. side of the family, my uncles, of course. played that stuff all day, you know. Yeah. Um, amongst other stuff, of course. So I grew up with Pink, and I didn't even know what progressive rock is, but I cannot pick them for this list, though. Personally, anyway, no offense to the fans out there, even though I know how huge they are. I know. And they help yeah. just 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 as much as Rush. Yeah. I'd say, uh, for that spot, for me personally. Even though it's an obscure band, it would be the hand, which Alan Holdsworth is also in. Nice. Never listened to them. Pretty good. I almost went for the it bites, but then I'm like, nah, I gotta go for the hand. Uh, All right. I some will, obscure stuff going on. I will go ahead yeah. and bring in my number eight. And this is gonna be a big one. This one's gonna shock all of you. <laughs> my number eight is actually IQ. Wow. They're probably my favorite oh. neo prog band. I don't think I hate one record except for 
Um, maybe one I'm not a huge fan of, but I think that overall, all of the albums that they've ever released are fantastic. They have some really great stuff. They have... They have their albums where they have you have to grow with it, but I think that overall, as a consistent band, they haven't released a bad album. They have amazing moments. They have their moments where there's a few times where there's there's some a little bit of mediocre songwriting, but overall, I think that they are a very good band, and I've always been a huge fan of them. Ever since I listened to Dark Matter, they've been a they've been a top twenty for me. And recently, thanks to the Road of Bones and Resistance, they managed to knock, cool. knock it up over Rush. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, yeah, I'll be, I'll be honest. I didn't like resisting as much. I remember me and you listening to the whole thing, and yeah. I was kind of like somewhat bored with it because they played so safe. And then I remember telling you, yeah. I listened to a little bit of the Road of Bones, but then we we went back to Road of Bones and yeah, restarted it. Yeah, and I'm like, wow. I said for me, they could be in the list, but if their albums were more like in the consistency of Road of Bones versus the Resistance. But because yeah. I haven't listened to all their albums, I think that they could I cannot put them. Because, I think they had a good potential. Because I mean, I mean, even though I think that Resistance is a, it's still a great record. I still think that there's a few um, mishaps right. on that on that album. For example, the Great Spirit way way too long, yes. way too all over the way place. Too long. Yeah. And Stay Down was not a very good song either. Um, mm-hmm. I would actually go ahead and say that the rest of the album is actually pretty damn good. There's some really great material on there. but I the, think second, the, best... the second disc is better than the first, in my opinion. I think that there are a lot better songs. Like, If Anything, Shallow Bay, um, A Missile, yeah. a missile um, um, even um, um, For Another Lifetime. That's a great epic. It and is. then you get to Perfect Space and Fallout, which are some of their best songs of all time. I'm gonna, but I'm gonna go ahead and say that ever are you sitting comfortably? Um, ever, ever, everything from ever to um, even I would even go ahead as far as their first album all the way to um, the Road of Bones, except for um, Seven Stories in the Night '89. That one's not a great album, but everything in, from there, great albums. Well, it's like the Resistance is like the Six Degrees. The albums kind that of divide is. you. You know yeah, what I mean? I guess so. You either like the first or the second. It's a mixed grab bag. Yeah. Well, six degrees, yeah. I like both. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Me too. But so, the fandom is like... Okay, we took a w long time on better. that one. We took a long time on that one. Dad number seven. Vandergraaf Generator. Ooh. Oh. Ooh, oh. nice. I'd listen to one Vandergraaf yeah. album so far. And I, I, I loved it, but still I need to listen to more. God Bluff. These are all, all, all perfect. I completely yeah. agree. God Bluff, Still yeah. Life. Um, uh, helium, uh, hydrogen and helium. Who am the only one? That's a great album. Um, yes. all we can do is wave to each other. Great as well. Uh, world record, also fantastic. That one's also my number seven. Yeah. Wow. Now let's get it out of the way because for me it was between Vendegraff and I'd say, oof, I think it was gonna be um, it bites. Matter of fact. Wow. I'm like, no, I cannot put <laughs> Vendegraaff below, you know, or even the listed by it. So I'm like, Vendegraaff yeah. is definitely my number seven. He could have been higher, though. He definitely could have been higher could have if been I was more accustomed higher. to that. Yeah. yeah. But go ahead. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, this, is a, this is something that's going to surprise, I think, all three of you uh, since I just got into them. But I, just, I binged all the records and I really, really got hooked. Uh, Haken. Yes. Oh, Haken's great. Haken is amazing. <laughs> Is it Hacken or Haken? Hacken. I don't know. People say it all the time. I, I say Haken. But whatever. Hacken. Yeah, okay. uh, I think all their albums have been really good. I've enjoyed all, all like I've enjoyed all, all their albums. I, I think what they do is they took the Dream Theater sound, they added a little bit of the gent, they added a little bit of the older gentle giant quirky vocal harmonies and that stuff. They added the 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 flute no they didn't do flutes but they they've done a little bit of more extended instrumentation a little bit more orchestral vibe of I course. think they did a the saxophone theater. I think they did a saxophone they did mistaken. they did yeah they did a saxophone yeah. not a flute a saxophone but yeah they've added more of the retro vibe than Dream mm-hmm. Theater but but also adding this modern vibe and I don't know I, I think I think this is the direction that Dream Theater should have moved in uh. It, you know, if I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure Portnoy called them his favorite band of the 2010s, and it makes sense. 
because to me it almost seems like the ultimate version of dream theater yeah it's, yeah. it's funny because they, they, had, they had this little gag where they called him portnoy dad like thanks dad on twitter <laughs> or something yeah yeah, yeah. when, when he did. said that virus was like its favorite album of 2020 yeah he's like yep. thanks dad that's what they say to him <laughs> yep okay let's uh continue number six dad Emerson Lake Bomber. Oh, oh, they're deep. Did I do seven? Oh yeah. Red six, right? Number six. Yep. But their debut. Yeah. Oh, so kind of like EOP. Oh, First four stuff. albums are all pretty much perfect. Yeah. Um, I think you can see some weakness once you get into the works and forward. And yeah. if they had just done three or four more albums, like. Tarkus and Trilogy, probably they'd be a little bit further up, but again, they're just a little bit light on the total volume, yeah. but uh, iconic sounding. and Very and true. Top, the top That's top. for sure. <laughs> even um, even a Pictures at an Exhibition is a fantastic record, so, you know. Well, you know, that's so, yeah. that's a, a cover of a classical piece by Modest Mazursky. By the way, so I, as much as I love it, it is. I love yeah. listening to it. It, it yeah. was like they didn't really write it. It was yeah, an of course, of course. So it's still great. I don't count it in their studio albums, but it's still amazing. Still I still great. love what they did with it. Go ahead, Ryan. Number six. My number six is Rush. Oh, very um, nice. Yeah, Rush is a band that was very influential to me. It was the first '70s band that I got into. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Alex Lifeson as a guitar player, hugely influential to me. Of course. Um, so you guys talked a lot about them. They do have their their stinkers, but if I, as I said, I looked at this like, how do the records that I like from them, you know, mm-hmm. impact me? And so when I'm thinking of records like Caress of Steel, like uh, Hemispheres, um, like Permanent Waves, yeah, um, Farewell to Kings, I look at those records and I say, wow, you know, those records have are truly amazing and they've impacted me in such a great degree. Yeah, of course, um, and, and they've impacted the world of prog in a great degree. So I had to put them at uh, number six. I think yeah. had they had a keyboard player, maybe they would have gone a little bit higher because I think a keyboard would have added a little bit more to their sound. Whereas Getty played the keyboards, but he wasn't all that proficient. And it was very sporadic. He just added that in for the vibe. But I think if they had a dedicated keyboard player, that would have added a little bit more to the sound. Of course. Got them higher up on the list. By the way, I don't, did I do seven? I'm kind of running. We're on six. You did uh, you did, you did seven was Vandergraaf, right? Yeah, you're seventh. Vandergraaf. Okay, let's just make sure I I'm on the Number program. Six, okay, my man. Six, six for me they could be higher, but because of my personal taste and because of their lack of progressive albums after the era of seventies, would be King Crimson. Ooh, um, yeah. Even even though they could, like I said, they could be higher because they jump started a bunch of stuff which we already talked about the top three of the 70s and whatever yeah the albums yeah. but as a band i'd have to put them on six because they personally for me after i started listening more to king crimson uh they helped me focus more when it comes to melody mood yes. together with the whole more shebang of bah, 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 you know crazy random uh, 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 stuff that comes from their introduction of jazz music or fusion music into rock, into rock music. Yeah. So I'd have to put them at six because of that. Also because like Rush, they suffer from their, you know, internal, I don't know if I could say fighting or members leaving, and which led them to have less progressive albums, in my opinion, kind of like of Rush. Of course. Um, but of course... I have not. I guess I have nothing else to add because they compose some of my favorite music of all time. But yeah. six for them. Um, my number six, and this one might actually surprise you all as well. I'm gonna go ahead and say Porcupine Tree, because one of my me. one of my favorite, well, my f- number five favorite record of all time is In Absentia. That is my that is a that is a staple album for me. It influenced a yeah. lot of my love for Stephen Wilson's albums that was the album that really uh brought my um attention to their albums i d- downloaded and listened to all of their albums at least 20 times for each and i can wow. honestly say that i love porcupine tree a great deal i honestly think that overall when you look at them musically they're 
better than Rush because they have a lot more prog. They're a lot more of an actual solid formed band. They know where they are. And they didn't Mm -hmm. have an identity crisis throughout their entire career. Rush started with an identity crisis and ended very mid in the early 80s with an identity crisis again. So for me, as a unified band and and a unified sound, Porcupine Tree has to be in there because... Everything from their right. first album to their last has been either mediocre to unbelievably good. Unbelie- like, unbelievably mind-boggling. Well, you said they didn't have an identity crisis, but I would, I would say that they really have two eras. They do. Which is, which is, which is pre-Agrafelt and post-Agrafelt. I that friendship, guess. you see how the in, it interjects with both bands. Me influence so, them. You, so it's yeah, like, oh, Opeth gets lighter, more progressive when he meets Steven Wilson. Yeah. And then Porcupine Tree gets heavier, less spacey, a lot more metal-oriented when he, he meets Ackerfeld. Um, well, I guess you could say that, but I think that the one thing that was very present in Porcupine Tree, even in their last album, even as far as uh, the, in the incident... Their biggest influences probably was Crosby, Stills, and Nash. They love yep. that folk, uh, that folk approach. They had yeah. a lot of Pink Floyd elements, even on the incident. I mean, even Fear of a Blank Planet is still very. It, I would say it's the metal Pink Floyd album. Actually, it's metal Pink Floyd. Mm. Same with the incident, but perfected. That's why they're number six, number I can see that. five, Dad. This one's going to be a. Maybe not surprising to some, my son Zoltan, but for hmm. you guys. Uh, number five, the Alan Parsons Project. Same here. Absolutely wow. agree. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's a... The that's first, a probably the first five, six albums, all the way up to Eye in the Sky. Love it all. It's all fantastic. I know they don't have sort of the busyness of some of the other prog bands, but in terms no. of writing beautiful songs from end to end and that's vocals true. that are just... Like that's so many great vocalists came through there, probably at least 15, maybe 20. I'm, yeah. And you hear different singers on different songs that fit the mood. Uh, nobody, nobody else really does that style where you have all these guest musicians and guest singers and really fits uh, yeah. fit every single song uh, to a T. So yeah. I'm actually going to go ahead and put this on, uh, on the record. I would actually go ahead and say that Symphony X borrows a lot from Alan Parsons project. When you listen so to do Arian. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you there hear all those lot singers of, coming in. Yeah, yeah. You have you have tales of mystery and imagination elements all over Symphony X. Tales of mystery and imagination is an orchestral progressive rock album. It's orchestral prog, yes. and that's what I can. It, it's so obvious to me that I don't even think they even have to cite Alan Parsons as an influence. Symphony X just borrows so much from from Alan Parsons. It's unbelievably how much they almost rip him off, actually. I've never seen them cite Alan Parsons. I guess maybe it it's was a just coincidence. It's so it, obvious. For me, I, maybe it's a coincidence because I've never heard them cite. I heard them cite Yes, Dream Theater, you know, Genesis, um, Kansas, even, but yeah. never a mention of Alan Parsons. But maybe you're right. Maybe they just don't want to. Yeah, don't the, wanna repeat I'll, I'll be honest. The, the the reason why when I know about Alan Parsons is because of Arian, because they mentioned how this. Oh yeah. Invite inviting all these singers to you know participate was an idea that alan parsons uh-huh. talked about it. of course you know what i mean course. to be honest that's and i'm like okay let me check them out mm-hmm. uh so, ryan and yeah go, go ahead Ryan. number five choice Ooh. another one that will surprise a lot of you excited uh, particularly because earlier on when i was more getting into Prague, i remember saying that i thought these guys were overrated but then i recently got bit by the bug checked out their whole discography and was blown away so number five is King Crimson. Fair enough. Yeah. I think they have so many good albums. Yeah. You know, in the court, in the wake of Poseidon. I just realized they both have in the in the wake of the court. That was definitely coincidence. Uh, you know. That was definitely, <laughs> definitely uh I think that was definitely uh, intentional. The intentional, yeah. Whether there's Lizard and there's Islands, there's uh there's so many great records. There's Larks, Red, Discipline. You know, exactly. the list goes on. There's, so yeah. many records and they've influenced my writing so much and i think they've influenced so many artists everybody from yeah. dream theater to even contemporaries of theirs you know yes and genesis of course you know, we're definitely influenced by king crimson so i have to of course you know nod the hat down for them because they yeah. really were the ones who you know brought prog from you know moody songs with that were like a, a little longer to something like really 
technical and fast and very proficient in what we know as the genre now. Uh, Thiago? And can I mention, they probably were the first bands to put heavy riffs in Prague. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Schizoid Man. Oh my God. Especially. And the jazz influence. Yeah, it's like riffs. It's like everything. It's like jazzistic like riffs. It's crazy what they did there with the chromatism. Okay, number five, right? Yep. Number five, I would say Emerson, Lake and Palmer for me, particularly because for me, they really started this whole idea of, uh, at least for me anyway, not have any vocals, Mm -hmm. just slide nods and vocals and carry, let's see if we carry on just a progressive rock band just by, you know, focusing on the keys. And I I was already coming off the coattails of like guys like Derek Shirini and Jordan Rudis, Kevin Moore, yeah, uh, to name others, of course, not just them. When it comes to key, keyboard players, and once I got into Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and I could hear my man, I mean, I, by that point, I thought Wick Wake Man was probably the greatest in my opinion uh-huh. back then. But at the same time, I was like, eh, I know people would call this wankery, but the man is doing an art form of wankery here that, for me as a music fan, is digestible. Yeah, and and it, it, it really helped me, um, to be honest, gain a greater appreciation for keys, how much they can hold a band on their own. Yeah, and the first time I listened to them, I was like, it's just three dudes because everybody was talking about Rush having three guys. I'm like, my god, they're doing way more. Yeah, and really and and to be honest, as a guitarist, I was even wondering, as a guy who once learned piano more, I kind of stopped learning piano to be honest with you guys years and i was like they don't really need a guitarist in this band (laughs) (laughs) this guy's doing everything by himself why would i put a guitar just to do the same lines uh different fifths and fourths just to do a harmony oh i don't know back in those days back in those days a guitar player wouldn't have been able to keep up no definitely not back in those days before before, because when we really think about it as a guitarist there was the guitar skills arms race started by eddie van halen exactly before then the guitar players were pretty sloppy if you're thinking about hendrix hendrix couldn't shred no i mean if if you had if you had john petrucci's back then or an ingve malmsteen then it would have made sense to put a guitar player the the only the only guy in my opinion that could try to do something was steve hackett or richie blackmore for sure hackett or, or blackmore even fripp a little even bit. Fripp no, to a certain extent. I don't think Fripp could do it. He's Fripp he's, wouldn't uh, have worked in the style. I'm just no, 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 not, not like through. Well, <laughs> Alan Holdsworth because he did Prague. Let's say Alan Holdsworth. Then. Oh yeah, for sure. Holdsworth. <laughs> That's it. Holdsworth. Holdsworth. Sure. Okay. Um, well, stylistically, it would have been Richie or Steve. Richie or Steve, yeah. Uh, but th- that's the thing. Like he blew my mind, man. How much that guy by himself was carrying the band, and it was such a oh, yeah. full sound. I wasn't never bored. A lot of people say, "Oh my God, it's too much for me." Like it never got too much for me. Me yeah, like never bored. To be honest. Let me say so, a side note about Wankery, right if, if I may. Wankery is an insult used by terrible Thank musicians you. who are jealous of other people. Okay, Thiago and Zoltan have heard me play guitar. Am mm. I a wanker? No, you're Absolutely very not. good. I wouldn't say I wouldn't. I, I appreciate that. I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't say I'm even that good. I'm just. I'm not a technical wanker. There's that a, there, there's a difference. Stuff. But yes. people say that to me. People who are just you know. For whatever reason, are jealous that I can do a faster scale run than no, than right. them. I mean, they say this guy's a wanker. All he does is the wank, uh, the mindless shred. That's the insult that bad musicians say to justify. Well, why here's, they a, can't here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. There, there's something called fast melodic lines, and yeah. they yeah. cannot. For example, they want you to be it. David. They want you to be a Gilmore to do the Dorian mode all the time. They'll do. Mad respect for my man Gilmore. Shout my out man, to him. Yeah. yeah. But I'm not going to be there holding the B flat five or the blue note for like five minutes. You know what I mean? On a band. Yeah, fair enough. Right. I'm not going to do that. I might do that for two, three seconds, but that's about it. Because if I'm going to go for banding, I'm looking at my man Gunther Govan. Because yeah. he knows <sighs> how to do that kind of stuff. He made Look it an art. Friend. He made it yeah, an he art. He made it an art. Right. And so, so, this guy, ahead. this for example, he wasn't even a Gilmore fan. He wasn't even a Hendrix fan. He was a Kurt Cobain fan. Oh, okay. I'm out. <laughs> Um, <laughs> can you can you call him over here? Because I despise Nirvana. Um, Sorry, guys. I'm gonna go ahead. Nirvana and, uh, is no good. I'm gonna go ahead and um, continue this train along and say, Dad, number four. What was your number five? It was the same Alan Parsons project. Okay. 
number four. Now we're just getting down to the the little few choices left, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, number four, yes. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Oh. That's a, I think it's that's a good, good placement for them. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of oh. getting so close now that it's... I would put them they higher, are, but They are. Good placement. But uh, I think yes has the, the moments where they're perfectly close to the edge and fragile. Yes. Going for the one. But then they have some... They have some other albums too. They're a lot of kind of filler where you're just like, oh come on, you guys could have done a lot better than that. Yeah, so, that's true. They're a little bit up and down, but when they're great, they're yeah. great. Yeah, when they're, they're great, I that's what I always argue. I think Genesis is a more consistent prog band, but I think Genesis. I mean, yes, when they're great, I, I would I would put them above Genesis. I personally. still love Tails. Tails is good. Yeah, I still love Tails. Yeah, I love it. Relayer is amazing. You hear that, Zoltan? Yeah, Relayer is amazing, Zoltan. I know. I love the album. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> took you a while. <laughs> it took me a day. <laughs> you listened. No, to I'm talking about the whole time relayer. you didn't listen to this yeah. album. That's what I'm You're saying. Me, you were listening to. You listened to the bad ones before you listened to Relayer. Actually, I know. I'm, I'm going to go bro. ahead and say this. I actually love oh, Talk. Content. Talk is a fantastic album. The talk isn't bad. I'm just saying talk is not a not a famous landmark piece like no, of course. But I mean that epic at the end. That's a that's a top. That's a fantastic epic. But uh, Ryan number four. You guys might smite me because this guy, this guy, singular guy. So now you guys know who it is. Uh He was progressive in a lot of things, but he was also a classical composer. He also did jazz. But I think as a whole, when we think about it, him as being a rock musician and everything he did, he has to be considered progressive, although he lamented over being called progressive. So now I'm number four is Frank Zappa. Uh, yeah. Frank Zappa is 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 my musical hero, for sure. Fair enough. He is just thinking about all the things he did. It, it was, you know, he was just thinking outside of the box. He's everything that progressive music, in my opinion, should be because he didn't think... You know, we can't do that. He said, let's try that. You know, he put R&B and soul into rock and then put jazz and doo-wop and, you know, modern classical music. He did everything. And I think, you know, the melding of the comedy and the lyrics and the satire, I, I think that all of that has influenced me in a, in a big, big way. Right. Yeah. And his, his, his albums speak for themselves. You know, The Grand Wazoo, One Size Fits All, Joe's Garage, um, My favorite. Hot Rats, just amazing, amazing records. Apostrophe. Yeah, oh, he, and, he was a funny dude, but he had great music to boot. And no and, one and, 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 and 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 he had the knack to invite great musicians. I mean, let's be honest, Vinnie Colaiuto is one of the biggest drummers of all time. Him and Terry Bozio. I mean, come on, Steve Vai too. Yeah, on the guitar. Um, Tina Turner on the backing vocals. It's one of the craziest things. Um, I know. So yeah, I, to be fair, I have not listened to every Zappa record because there's like two hundred. I know, yeah, but I've listened to all the right. I've listened to all the landmark ones, all the definitive ones that people actually listen to. Hey, Go man. ahead, Thiago. Uh, my number four. Yeah, your number Gentle four. Giant. Gentle Giant. Ooh, another one that I need to listen to more. Definitely, to Gentle Giant. I mean, yeah, the Power and Glory, the Octopus. I mean, they do like this perfect meld of the quirkiness, the jazz, the prog, the symphonic. I mean, I know Even they don't focus a yeah. lot of the classical, and it sounds so like out of place, but it makes perfect sense at the same time. The music, doo, 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 doo. I'm like, what? It sounds like a fair mu- fair song, you know, like are you going yeah. on the tra- uh, amusement park? Totally. But you're here progressive. I'm like, so yeah. General Giant person for me is that band that I would never ever get sick of tired of them, except missing. Beast, right? Was oh, I, the album? I, I still like that album a lot. I still like the album, but it's probably one of their weakest, if not their weakest album. I think that opinion. their weakest has to be Giant for a Day. That's their weakest. Okay. For sure. Okay. Yeah. But I'm going to go ahead and for say. Me, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No. No, go ahead, Zilton. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say this. My my number four was actually a three way tie. Ah, oh, I hear you. It, I couldn't pick, and they are Each so high up on the list. It, they're so high up. And unfortunately, the the next three are better, in my honest opinion, and I like them a little bit more. So it's a three-way tie between Yes, Gentle Giant, and Alan Holdsworth. Oh, okay. Because I love 
I love every Ellen Holsworth record. Even Sand, I like. I still like Sand. Even Sand. <laughs> I still like Sand. Even though I think it's the, his most typical one and his most boring one, I still think it's good. Um, Gentle Giant. Boring there's, Sims for hours. There's, uh, uh, Gentle Giant needs no introduction. Everything from their debut to even as far... I even love Civilian. I think Civilian's a great album. Uh, Gentle G- Giant for a Day has Friends, which I think is a great song, but Giant for a Day is a little bit of a mixed grab bag of bad and great songs. But I think that Gentle Giant's an obvious a self-explanatory pick for me. And of course, mm-hmm. yes, obviously another self-explanatory pick. Yeah. Number three, Dad. I, you've already nailed it all, Gentle Giant. Yeah. All the reasons you guys just cited. Phenomenal band. I need yeah. to listen to more of their music. You, you should. do. You do. Again, on your ass. Listen to two on, al- only two albums. I'm By the way, to, I'm gonna. Go what's ahead. the third one I should listen to? I'm gonna go. To ahead be and, honest, to be honest, uh, to be honest, the number, the top four for me are kind of equal. But yeah, that's the thing. Just, I mean, you me have too. Six, the top four are pretty equal. You have you have six albums that are equally as good as each other. But I'm gonna go ahead yep. and say this: their easiest album, and I think the- Thiago, you can agree with, and Dad, of course, both of you can agree with me on this: their easiest album to get into has to be Freehand. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. I mean, I've already listened to the Power and the Glory and Octopus, and I love them a lot. What, um, what, 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 Dad? Freehand next. What? I agree with you, son. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, number three, I think Thiago and Zoltan know the next three. Um, number three is Genesis. Oh, that's oh, that hurts. <laughs> I gave it top three position. I'm just kidding. It's all. It's I was all even opinion. considering putting Zappa above Genesis, but they Oof. they went above a little bit. Yeah, um, I understand that. Um, Genesis. So they were the first prog rock band I got into, other than Rush. They were the real one that like thrust me into the '70s sound. Yeah. Um, definitely very influential to me. Influential in my writing. I love a lot right. of their records. Um, of Trick of the Tail and Selling England, Foxtrot, Nursery mm-hmm. Crime, Wind and Wuthering. The Lamb. You know, all all just great stuff. The Lamb, Duke, oh, such yeah. great stuff. They were a very stuff. consistent band. Right. Um, you know, Steve Hackett is inspiration on the guitar. Yeah. Peter Gabriel, you know, as a front man is something I try to be, even though I'm tied down to having a guitar. Even being a frontman, also, yeah. I still strive to try and entertain in the same yeah. way, you know, with his banter and everything, you know. Yeah, he's just he was a one in a million. Yes. Um, and his vocal style, too, very influential. The key sounds are in Genesis, it's just everything. Yeah, you know, they were, they were one of the most impactful bands for me, Thiago, for sure. Well, I have to agree with uh, Ryan when it comes to number three, be Genesis personally for me. Um, they could be higher. They could be, um, and I and I just put out there because some I think some of my friends are going to be surprised. I'm not even naming Opeth or other bands like Haken, Leprous, right? No. Um, the reason why I'm naming the more older bands is because I've been into more more evident, evident before. Went back to the past and realized that this is what really shaped what I'm listening to currently. 2020. Exactly. Yeah, of course. All those bands, I love them. They could be definitely here on my top four if it was like a modern band. They'd be a top four, like Hacken or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. All these guys. Um, but because I'm talking about of all time, like time immemorial since the yeah. genre started, Genesis, some of the reasons why um, Ryan said, I think they only suffered because then after Phil Collins took over and they moved into more, more of a pop uh, uh, sound, if they continue with the prog, if Peter Gabriel stayed in the band, so to speak, and... Definitely, they could be like a number two, whatever. I think I think Hackett was the big guy because they, they he was did a big two guy, albums. Yeah. They do two albums, Phil as frontman, and they stayed in the very prog direction. It was it different. Right, I think, right. I don't think Trick of the Tail sounds like Selling England. It's a different record. No, it's, it's a different, different record for they sure. They were changing sure. their sound, but it was still a prog record. It still was symphonic. It was prog definitely. It is definitely. We, right, nobody can take that away from them. So they've been influencing me a lot, especially lately. Oh yeah, um, bro! I can like stop listening to them actually because I hear how many of the bands I love, including my number one favorite. Same, me took, too. Took a lot. Like you got a like, cinema show. I'm like, yeah, that's Octavarium. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? I'm like, come Just on, the, Dream Theater. Was, the first song I listened to from Genesis was "Found of Salamacus," which is very weird because oh, that's, not, that's not that popular. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's one of so my I'm favorites. Like, 
It's one of my favorites. I, but I listen to that section where it's like the keyboards right. and the guitars are trading off. And I'm like, and I be being a Dream Theater fan, I'm like, this is familiar. I've heard this right. somewhere. Well, for me, it's like the, the five, the top five for me that influenced all the other bands that I currently had as my favorite, like as a younger guy, right? The, the yes, younger yeah. generation. General Giant, yes. Genesis, King Crimson. And I'd say Pink Floyd, but I put Rush, right? What's right, between yeah. them? Uh-huh. but at the same time i'm like i hear nods in the modern music that i hear i hear so many nods to the older bands that every time i go back and listen to foxtrot and whatever i'm like i hear all them guys sounding exactly like that oh yeah but they just have more I of a modern approach for That's my number it. one it's more present with my number two the nods exactly. that i hear so okay yeah. genesis i don't want to uh, make this any longer so go ahead genesis number three no, genesis be my right. uh, no, my number three my number three is Camel. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. And that's not even a contra. That's not even a hot take. That's actually a no, common no, no, one. Not at all. From the, I can from see the, why. From the four albums that I've listened to, they're phenomenal. So I will I'm not gonna take say that this. away from you. I'm going to say this. I put even, a video out recently um, playing Camel, so come on. I'm going to go ahead and say this. I don't think they've ever, not in their, in, in their career, not one time have they released a bad album. They are all either good or fantastic they had never released a bad record i would right. say that their weakest has to be their debut but still i mean they that's still a great record to be for expected. me it's kind of to be expected you know yeah, it is debut. of course it's it's their trespass for sure actually i would say maybe mirage is their trespass but i still love mirage, mirage but i'm gonna go ahead trespass. and i'm gonna go ahead and say that their best albums are they're so definitive for me um moon madness uh, snow goose and i can see your house from here those are my three um mm-hmm. with the rest of their albums tied at uh, tied, tied at fourth so um you know breathless rain dances all of those are great dad number two i uh, again you just stole all my thunder so uh camel <laughs> yeah, yeah so that's why you guys were so mad when i put them in honorable mentions oh yeah just it, there's i apologize there's there are bands that you have to be in the right mood for like i can't yeah. listen to jethro tall every day there's no, some same here. Why they're you know, camo, camos all the time. Camo, I can listen to pretty much every day. Exactly. Time, exactly. Yeah. Even, even with the even with the few albums that I've listened to, it's like I can. Moon Madness is very good for the night, especially. Yeah. Oh. Snow Goose for the day. But there's always there's an album for for each mood. And there's each an that's album so true for them from them. There's one album that fits every mood. You could listen to, to "I Can See Your House from Here" and you could be like, "This, this, this song fits one mood." And it's a, it's a, it's a mixed grab yeah. bag of moods, and it's a perfect album. Ryan, number two. Number two. This is a this is a pick that's very obvious. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Uh, of course, yeah. You know, yes is yes is is to me what Prague should strive to be. Yeah, you know, it is. Completely agree. It's, this amazing you know it's just these soundscapes and this orchestral <laughs> they have their sound know, they just have their sound and it's perfect and they no do. one they tell do. me otherwise exactly it, it to me it, this is what music should sound like completely agree the well, agro- I heard close to the edge with, with yeah. the middle section y- y- yes and yes with the, or- my- with the, with the yeah. organ 100%. and stuff i was like this is what music should be I and it's an expression agree. It's a journey oh, that you take God. when you listen to a Yes album. Close to the number edge. two. Oh, Go ahead, Thiago. Number two is the same, and not to make things long, but like I said, similar reasons for Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Yes made me appreciate uh, keyboard players, the wizard. Yes. My man, Rick. Oh, yeah, Rick Wakeman's a wizard. You know, on the drums, My of course. Keyboard player. Oh, and no, Rupert. Because, and the yeah. bass. Chris and Squire's because the guitars, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and yes, that's where the guitar is one of them bands that the guitars really doesn't matter much. Yeah, it, it, it don't matter. I mean, Steve Howe as a writer, very good, but I don't think it's very good. As but a, a guitarist, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, it, yeah. So, right. So Rick is uh, in the same league for me as uh, Keith Emerson, yeah. so to speak. To be honest, yeah. But because he's but because he's more of a more of a solidified band, he you know yes becomes a number two. Well. Emerson Lake and Palmer, I think it was my fifth or my sixth, right? Yes. Yeah, it was. And yeah. like I said, he helped me gain so much respect for keyboard players of how much they do, how Thank much you, they man. have at their disposal. While I'm picking my six strings here, this guy has keys all over around him. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, bruh, 
Yeah. <laughs> I need to up my game. So, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Let, let, me, let me just say one more thing about them. Cool. I yeah. think their music is just incredibly impactful. It is. Impactful. It. True. That's the one word I can use. It, yeah. Everything with these vocal harmonies and all the layering. They were the queen of prog rock because Queen was known for spending a, like a million years in the studio and layering all these sounds. You know, I, I just, yeah. I, I really fell in love with, with all of that, all the vibes and everything yeah. that they do. Yeah. Okay. Well, it Very definitely it's, my it's, writing for yeah, sure. It's, 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 um, they basically, to be honest too, while you were saying that, um, like Genesis, a lot of the times of their lyrics weren't as great as Genesis, in my opinion. Oh, of course. Very yeah. like nonsensical. Yeah. That's um, what I love about them. They're just but, so at the, funny. but at the same time, even though the lyrics could be nonsensical, the harmonies that they created with those nonsensical lyrics. And I am even of the opinion that I think they did it on purpose because it would sound so harmonious. It was. Right? I'm like, it doesn't matter if they sing in something that doesn't rhyme or doesn't really make sense. It's a non sequitur. It yep. just, the sound itself of the singing of the voice is yeah. just, I don't care if they were humming. You know what I mean? Yeah, literally. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I think, I, I think it right. is John Anderson for me that puts uh, Yes above Genesis a bit. Yeah, and I, the, all these those harmonies they did that moment in close to the edge with the I get up, I get down, and yeah. that is just so, all that is of my a favorite sudden, moment in music. Just that all of so a sudden, favorite moment church in music. organs, just all of a sudden, church organs. Oh, it's perfect. That's the it's perfect beautiful. Moment. I, I, I can't, I can't disagree. You can't argue with that. It's, it's, it's can't beautiful. Argue. Um, by the way, this might not even come to us come to us as a surprise for both all the rest of you, but my second favorite band of all time is the Flower Kings. They have so many amazing moments. There's so many albums that are just beyond perfect. And for me, I think that they took that Genesis Yes sound, modernized it, and made it their own. And I think that that's what's really great about them. They revived Symphonic Prague, and they really helped solidify the path. And now they are the Symphonic Prague band of the now. They are the mm -hmm. band that continues Symphonic Prague, and they will always continue they have made a vow to continue with the symphonic prog line that yes in genesis unfortunately disclosed and they are they are taking it to the next step making it their own and i freaking love them for that i will always see them as a, a very poorly underrated band that should very be very much be brought into the light and appreciated because eventually 20 years down the line they're going to be seen as progressive rock legends I think one of the things that hurt them, to be honest with you, if I have to is say anything, is their like, blues stuff. Their bluesy stuff, the simplified stuff, and I just hope they continue the journey, like you said. And I love them. I have nothing against them. I do love uh, Jamie. Once I started listening more to Flower Kings, and saw Jamie playing, I would people would crucify me for this, but I'd say in some ways it's better than my man Gavin. Well, Gavin is more technical than him. Totally I think agree. Jamie Salazar. So Jamie is more musical than, than Gavin. Jamie Salazar, in my honest opinion, and Dad, you will agree with me on this, I know, because we've we've agreed on this a bunch. Jamie Salazar is the perfect progressive rock drummer. He is. He is the He's perfect one progressive rock drummer. He's Dad, amazing. That guy, number one. That one. Oh, this is so easy. So easy for me, too. <laughs> I have had the same so favorite progressive rock band since 1980 genesis same yep. year genesis yep. for me they're i don't even think that I'm, I'm this is something that we might disagree on actually but i actually don't think that even their bad albums are bad i think that when you look at them in today today's spec spec um in today's um perspective their bad albums are actually pretty good you know, yeah. I, I'd agree with you because I can yeah. sit down and I can jam on some Invisible Touch, even that title track, you know, it's yeah. not, I think we hate it more because it's not the band that we love. It's not Prague. Totally. Like, it's like, oh my God, it's not Prague. Oh, this is bad. No, it's not. We've the music itself is not bad. It's just not progressive. It's just not yeah, progressive. Of I can yeah. sit down, That's you know, music. I, get in a good mood, put it on the car, put on Invisible yeah. Touch, you know, have a good time. 
Exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this. I think that there are some great moments, even on Invisible Touch. You have uh, Into Deep, Tonight, Tonight, Tonight. Um, of course, Throwing It All Away and um, uh, Domino. That's a great song. Domino I love. Uh, I love. I love. Uh, we. I love. We can't dance. I love that album. I don't like the track, the title track at all. I think I can't dance is probably their worst the song worst, ever written. Worst Genesis song. And but I think that there's so many great songs. No son of mine is a great song. I think that uh, the dividing line. Uh, no. Uh, uh, what was that? There was another 10-minute song other than Fading Lights, but I can't remember the name of it. I always get it mixed up with uh, the one on uh, Calling All Stations. But I think that half of the material on We Can't Dance actually is pretty good. Even uh, There's not very many songs on uh, their debut that I can get into. Uh, a Place to Call My Own is good. Trespass is a great record. Everything from then to their latest stuff, I still love. So I'm a huge Genesis fanboy, and I will always be a huge Genesis fanboy. And we've been looking at Zoltan to, uh, you know, for this band, the the musical box from Quebec. Yes, amazing you know, stuff. I think now I'm like ten or eleven or twelve times I forget, but yeah, I've got, I've gotten to go back in time, ten times to 1973 and see what it was like. <laughs> Every time that show, even if I've seen it six times, it's still to me it's up. It's mind boggling. Horizon. They recreate it, right? Oh, it's the With best the recreation ever. It's the best recreation it's, it's ever. Absolutely perfect. I can see that. If, if right. you ever go, if they ever come down to where you live, Ryan, do not uh-huh. pass up an opportunity to see them. You will, bl- it, they will literally blow you away. They do all the costumes I know perfectly. Hackett was coming down. I was actually considering going, but then coronavirus happened. Yeah. Uh, he was doing his, you know, Genesis Revisited kind of yeah. tour. Exactly. So yeah, I would but, have been really yeah. down to see that. Yeah. By the I'm way, here. I'm here. I even told Zoltan that. Yeah. By the way, I already know both yeah. of your f- number one, Ryan Thiago. I know both of your number so, one. So Dream Team Can I go? Jerk Part Two. Yeah. I know. Circle Jerk Part Two. Okay. <laughs> I know. I know. I know my man Brian. I mean, we have discussions about this, and I totally understand his side. He explained to me some stuff he thinks about Dream Theater, and I can definitely see. Mm-hmm. Um. Like I said, those other bands, Genesis, whatever, those guys could have definitely take this spot. But personally, in my life, it's a total subjective thing. Yeah. Not it objective. Is. It's just total subjective right now. I'm gonna totally going to be somebody who's not necessarily going to be objective. If I have to be objective, Dream Theater might not even be in the list in some ways. You know what I mean? Yeah. Of course. Um, I, would, I would say the same. Right. But for me personally, as a musician, a fan of music, and somebody who's a lover of music, Dream Theater came to me in a part of my life where I was looking for my voice because I was doing a lot of Joe Satriani covers, Steve I covers, listening to a lot of Neil Young, you know, listening to a lot of like stuff like that. Um, Metallica, Iron Maiden, you guys know that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I still was like, really like, okay, I love all this. I love all this stuff, but I want something that really like helps me solidify who I am as a musician and yeah. somebody who appreciates yeah. loves music. And that's when my friend Andrew Victorino, shout out to you, Andrew. Thank you for that. He's a drummer, by the way. Introduced me to Dream Theater 2004. We were going to Boston, and I didn't even know who this kid is. He's just me, my friend Neil. By the way, Neil, his, his brother Tarsus, who are the sons of another guy considered my master. He's a jazz fusion master. Introduced me to Pat Matheny, by the way. And other guys, John McLaughlin and all the other guys. Yes, we were sir. in the car, and, and these kids, the, the jazz fusion kids, we're not the kind of kids who really listen like to metal or whatever. Yeah. They kind of knew what Prague was. And then my man put Dream Theater Octavarium and he put like, you know, these walls there. No, no. Actually, I lie. He put uh, Train of Thought and he put Six Degrees of Inner Turbulence. Yeah. And we were like, who the heck are these guys? Like, oh. Same. And that's when I was like, that is it. That's the type of yes. sound I want to make. Yes. My God. Who are these guys? And through them, I became more appreciative of the bands I love that I named on my top 10 now. Because they're the ones said, these guys are the ones that influence our sound. If it wasn't for Genesis, if it wasn't for Pink Floyd, if it wasn't for Geno Giant, and all them guys, Dream Theater would not exist. And what I also appreciate is the fact that I divide progressive music into this era, like the Old Testament and New Testament, right? Yeah. You have the Old Testament with the great progressive rock bands, and they died an ugly death by the hands of grunge and pop and glam. Punk. 
And oh. here is this band, even though I do have appreciation for the other prog bands of the late 80s or, you know, mid 80s when they're just rising up like Dream Theater in the 90s. Dream Theater by themselves went through a lot of struggle as individuals, as musicians, to keep this freaking genre alive, to give it another injection. Yeah. And my biggest appreciation, think what you want of the guy, is Mike Portnoy, because while the other members kind of felt seduced by the music industry in some ways. He stuck to his gun. He stuck to his guns and said, I'm going to leave the band. If these guys, what are you going to do? Not prog? I'm out. And then they made the, and they made it. And, the edge of the 90s. Right. And that's why a lot of kids nowadays even know who Genesis is. They even know who Rush is. And to be honest, because Myself. Dream Theater be shouting them out all the damn time. You know, Dixie Drags or whatever. Bands that people don't even yeah. listen to. Um, um, so personally can I, can for me, my, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 finish your, finish your thought. I thought Zoltan well, basically this is why for me personally, not only as a musician, but somebody who loves music, what they mm -hmm. did for Prague was give this, you know, third rate rising on the Sunday for progressive music, even though yeah. they might, they might be overrated. I understand some people think they, they might are. be overrated. The vocals, especially, I understand all that, but I'm mm -hmm. going by what they did musically and what they did for the genre. Yeah. They yeah, put okay. it back on the map. They're not even saying, oh, we're the face of progressive music. They're like, nah, we're just trying to revive this genre that is all the greats paved the path for us that we're walking yes. on right now. Well, go ahead, Ryan. Um, okay, so I have a very similar story to Thiago. So right. they came to me at a time when I was very into, I was listening to uh, Metallica and Iron Maiden and yeah. I was getting better at guitar at this point. So I was I was listening to the Marty Friedman solo records, Ingve Malmsteen Rising Force, you know, that yep. kind of stuff. Uh, Steve Vai, just Triani, all that stuff. And then I heard this. I heard, you know, I was already a Dream Theater fan. Not a Dream Theater fan, but I had heard Pull Me Under, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then I heard Change of Seasons. Change of Seasons is a 23-minute epic. It's it's like Dream Theater's Supper's Ready in a lot of senses. Yeah. A lot of different sections, a lot of different sounds in that piece. And that really, it opened my eyes to just everything I wanted to do. This was, I, like, I as I said earlier that I was listening to Metallica and Iron Maiden and Megadeth. And I, I always said, I like these melodic sections. I like when they do all that stuff. I like the longer pieces. So dream theater was really the band that they did all that stuff. They did these longer pieces. And I said, it was a light bulb moment. I was like, this is what I've been yeah. looking for always. Yeah. And, you know, as I said, I, it was at a time when I was getting better at guitar. So John Petrucci, you know, hearing him play guitar, that was, you know, an, an awe inspiring moment. He's my guitar hero in in right. every single respect of the word yeah and, and as i said it opened my eyes to other forms of music so I, I heard the jazz influence i heard the classical influence you know that stuff so then as a result of listening to dream theater i was listening i was i started listening to paganini and i started listening to yeah you know stuff sure. like miles davis because they said well we like classical and we like jazz too and we like all this stuff so i, I became i went from a metalhead to a, a music fan by listening to dream theater yeah. And, you know, if we th just talk about my writing, you know, my writing is is dream theater through and through. So they've had, right. a, and a, so, um, a, you know, this very big impact on me. As and, a they, and they don't have I, an ego. Uh, they don't try. They don't try to go out there as it's like, oh, we're the face of progress. Like, no, they're always, they're always like so humble about it. They always say, oh, uh, what influenced me to write this song was Peter Gabriel. What influenced this song we write was freaking out uh, Rick Wakeman. Or yeah, they always tell him um, they, they understand it. Not that original. You know what I mean? They do, yeah, of course. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, cut this piece now because right. this episode is already getting way too long. <laughs> um, yeah, we're right. already oh, at two yeah. and a half hours. Already Ooh. at two and a half hours. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring We're out the last fun. subject. I'm gonna bring out the last subject, which is jazz fusion and its influence on Prague. Dad, why not you start off the subject? Oh, geez, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well. I mean, um, I did have some notes somewhere on this. Yeah. <laughs> just can't remember what I did with it. Oh, yeah. So when, when you told me about this, the first thing I thought of was that a lot of the early Genesis stuff probably wouldn't have happened the way it happened, like Cinema Show and stuff, if Phil Collins hadn't had such a, a love of all those jazz fusion bands of the early 70s, like Mahavishnu and Return Brand to Forever. X. Probably what? Report. Well, he was in Brand X, yeah. So yeah. Um, so I think probably that's been the biggest influence, even though those bits didn't actually sound like jazz. No. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Another band that comes to mind for me is that Camel really knew how to get that jazz fusion sound yes. into Prague with still having it sound a bit jazzy, but not too jazzy. So yeah, that I love Camel so much is because they can they took that Jean-Luc Ponte type thing and they put it in there very yes. nice and smoothly, right? And it just yes. made, the, you know, all the things that you like when you listen to those Jean-Luc Ponte type albums, right? All that sort of, you know, spacey music, right? Very yeah. mellow and, and lots of really fast playing and stuff like that. But still, yes. you know, they, they are able to do that. So those are the things that I think were probably the two influences that I find I mean, most of the other bands don't really have very much jazz, you know, just a little bit here and there. I'm going to go ahead and actually um, maybe bring in another one. And I think um, Ryan and Thiago, both of you are probably thinking about this one too. Mm -hmm. Relayer by Yes. That's a very jazz oh, fusion yeah. album. That has a lot of jazz Big fusion time. elements. It's probably their most experimental album, even to date. Uh, the, I think that their two experimental albums, their most experimental albums, actually have to be Tales from Topographic Oceans and Relayer. Those are their two most ex experimental albums. And you albums. get King Crimson. And you get the Red. Different reason. Red. Um, you have a lot of jazz yeah. fusion in there. Lark's Tongue. Lark's even Starless Lord. and Bible Black. Starless Bible Black, uh, yep. Lizard. I'm fully I think improvised his, Lizard is probably their most um, jazz fusion. Power and Glory. Power, Power and Glory. Glo no, maybe more Freehand, because when you listen to Power Free and the Glory... Yeah. The power and the glory is way more baroque, way more atonal classical rather well, than jazz. Well, fusion. He, 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 has a, he has a lot of like a gypsy bluegrass stuff too, though. If you think a about little it. bit, but it's definitely yeah. more atonal, uh, True. baroque, uh, baroque classical music, and that's what they said that True. they were listening to when they wrote the power and the glory was True. atonal, yeah. like um, yeah, Tone you know, uh, yeah, um, you it's have uh, yeah, Trevin um. Stravinsky, yo, and they were of course listening to Bach. They were listening to the Baroque era, the Romantic era stuff. That was, f yeah. But I think that for sure, uh, Interview and Freehand are their most jazz fusion. That's their when they mm -hmm. turned jazz fusion more, mm -hmm. and they tried to go that more jazzy approach rather than the classical approach. You can definitely hear that on Freehand, especially with the opening track called "Just the Same." The amount of polyrhythms is insane i don't think I've, I've ever heard a band use that many different polyrhythms with each instrument before the vocals are on a different time signature than the drums the keyboards are on a different time signature than the vocals the the even the guitar is on a different time signature than the keyboards drums and vocals combined and the bass as well well what but, but what do you guys think of the jazz fusion bands that influenced that instead of just talking about the progressive rock bands and the sounds I was oh, going to talk about that uh, yeah, very much. Sure. I think the lines between what was prog rock and what was jazz fusion were pretty blurred once you got to bands like Mahavishnu. Oh, completely. Return Mahavishnu, Mahavishnu, yes. They're electric bands. Even a little bit of Miles mm -hmm. Davis. You know, what, yeah. what was prog? West what was Montgomery. Fusion? Yeah, all that stuff. What was And Holdsworth and, you know, stuff like that. It, the lines between what was prog and what was fusion were pretty much blurred. Uh, and yeah, these bands, sure. they influenced each other because... You know, I, I don't really think a band like, say, the Miles Davis Eclectic period would be rock oriented if it wasn't for the progressive rock bands and the and the, the proto prog bands that were going on at that time. Totally, I completely so, agree. And, and if we're really talking about the influences, so I can hear a lot of, I, I can uh, if we're thinking about modern bands, I I think I can hear a lot of something like a fusion band like, say, the Dixie Dregs in Dream Theater. Yep. Yes, so, yeah. The Dixie Dregs. I Petrucci has said that Steve Morse is his favorite guitar player, and that you know they were listening to a lot of Dixie Dregs and Return to Forever when they were doing you know stuff like Images and Words, and, and it's influenced their instrumental sections, the the keyboard, uh, guitar, you know, trade offs. Yeah, uh, you know, all that stuff has been very influenced by that kind of thing. Of they, course, I yeah. remember him remarking that. You know, they liked Yes and Genesis and Rush and stuff like that. But then when they were getting like really, really good at their instruments, they wanted to have that music, the Yes, the Genesis, the Rush, whatever, but make it a little more technical, going to another, you know, level of technicality, adding the metal too. But I think yeah. that was a big part of the, the technicality aspect of, uh, of uh, Dream Theater in particular is because of they were listening to the jazz fusion because in terms of prog bands, even you know, even when you're looking at prog bands, Dream Theater is like a cut above. They do more of that. 
you know. They definitely do. Petrucci, Petrucci was definitely, he said, uh, when, he was, when he got to Berkeley, for example, that's when he was introduced a lot to that, you know, more. He was, he was, he's like, yeah, I already listened to it, but I got really deep. Uh, more jazz deep fusion. The Holdsworth, I'm, too. Yeah, Holdsworth I'm, stuff, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say this, and I know that this might be a little bit controversial, but I, I've listened to a lot of their albums, and I and I find that when the, you listen to them going into their instrumental sections, you do hear a little bit of jazz fusion elements, but I think it's mainly just technical metal. But I think that the one band that actually does jazz fusion elements a lot more is actually the Flower Kings. I mean, you hear them doing jazz no. fusion. Play. No, hold on, hold on, no. hold on. Hold on. The entire, oh my God. Hold on. Let me, explain, let me explain. The entire, uh, the entirety, let me explain. The entirety of Unfold. You better. The, the entirety of Unfold the Future. That is all free improvised jazz. Every, all of them were saying that they were listening to Mahavishnu. They were listening to, to um, they were even listening to stuff like um, Jean-Luc Ponte when they were writing The Sum of No Evil. There's a lot of jazz fusion elements all over there. Even uh, Stardust We Are has amazing jazz fusion uh, stuff. Like um, uh, Just This Once has that uh, that lick in 7-4 uh, seven, seven where they're going into that more traditional jazz piece. And they are definitely bringing in a more traditional jazz sound. Rather Traditional, than... not fusion. Hold on. I did say that they were bringing in the Jean-Luc Ponte, Alan Holdsworth type stuff on the Summer No Evil and on Fold the Future. But, but Alan, Alan Holdsworth is not traditional. Alan Holdsworth no, that's, changed the no, face of freaking that's, jazz fusion forever. No, I, think you missed, I think you misheard what I was saying there. I said that they were bringing the modern jazz fusion sound in with that, with the the Alan Holdsworth, the Jean-Luc Ponte, and bringing it into those albums that they were doing. L go back and listen to those albums. You'll hear it. I you did. I it. did. But they weren't that strong, like, in the proficiency of what they're doing. When I mean, you, you mean to tell me... When you go back and listen to it, it's way more similar. It's way more similar. Because when you l hear it, M J J Dream Theater brings the more metal sound, which they never no, did but we're, we're not, then. We're, we're not. No, we're never talking. We're talking about is, similar. We're talking about incorporating that style I into their understand. own music. I understand, and of course, that's what the Trial of Tears. As well. I listen. Trial of Tears beyond this. Be okay, here, here Zotan. Tra Trial of Tears. I know. I know. Hell's, that one. Ki Hell's Kitchen. That one I know too, but that one's more camel. Beyond this, beyond this life. No. Lines in the Hell sand. No. Lines in the sand. <laughs> Octavarium, the instrumental Change section. Change of seasons. Change of seasons. Okay. Uh, uh, did I say Beyond This Life? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Beyond This Life. Uh, solitary part Show. One. Metropolis Part 1. I mean, okay. I could go on, brother. And I'm I saying, understand, but the when you listen... Trushy played a Holdsworth chord in those instrumental clean sections. The way that he voices those chords. Listen to a song like Afterlife. The... Do -do 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 -do. I understand. Yeah. But look, when, at innocent, I, look at his solos for Innocence Faded. The tapping, but, yeah. the tapping Guys. chord voice. All Listen, Zotan, Zotan, I, Zotan. The, okay. solo, the solo for Innocence Faded, the solo for Under Glass Moon. I understand those ones. I, those are the obvious picks. The solo to lie is... All, all of those are the obvious everywhere. picks. That's the Those are the obvious picks. But then again, that's the earlier stuff. But as soon as you go from past Octavarium, they start to they start to not use those anymore. Where the Flower Kings has been doing it since they first started. They do it way more than the Flower... Than the, than, uh, than but not as proficient, man. Not at the same level of like technicality and creativity. Come on. No, but they definitely the have the more... It. It's more of a feel thing than they're going for the technicality of okay. it. Okay. Because and also, if you're gonna, I'm gonna go, they do more blue stuff. I'm, uh, I would say that they play a lot more jazz fusion uh, feel stuff than blues, because every album they at least have, they have maybe one or two blues songs on every album since uh, the Rainmaker, but ever ever since then, I mean, it's been mainly right. jazz fusion. I'll, I'll, I'll have to give you this though, when it because, comes to the jazz fusion part of Flower Kings, I'd say the guy who sticks out the most is the drummers. Yeah. I'm gonna say this. Yeah. They, everyone, even when they said that they were writing stuff for the Rainmaker, the thing that they were right, they were listening to most was Brand X. They said that they were huge Brand X fanatics and they wanted to write like right. that. And it's that so true. so obvious how much Brand X influence there are since Space Revolver. Even I mean, there's so much jazz fusion on all of those albums. You just have to, you okay, have to you know actually what? sit down and listen to them, and you'll hear it. It'll be like clear as day. But I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, bring in some. Yeah, because you're thing. dead. Yeah, we, 
Yeah, because oh. your dad's owed this. They're waiting. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and say this. Alan Holdsworth probably brings in the most technical, and he is probably the most uh, technical jazz fusion artist we know because he changes chords every two seconds. There's not a single song in his discography that holds on to a chord in the same way for more than 10 seconds. He changes chords every three seconds. Well, I mean, the guy is insane. Well, well, true, true, true. But I'll say this. Go ahead. I don't know. I don't know if Brian can agree with me. I don't know what's his opinion on it. I, but I, I would put Pat Metheny a little bit above Alan Holdsworth because he works uh, with largest, he works with largest scales guitars. He works I, with more guitars, yes. and the scaling of his guitars are more demanding than Alan's. Alan's guitars, the neck, the width, the scaling, yeah. is better fit for those types of chords and stretches. My man Pat. Yeah, he works with traditional jazz guitars and synth guitars. Oh, of course. So I, I'd say the phrasing, I mean, the dominance that Holdsworth has is a slight above Pat, but the choice of notes and chords, in my opinion, I prefer Pat's, especially I because I, agree. I, I, I think for me, just a slight, it's a bare, it's basically a tie, but I think I prefer Holdsworth yeah, okay. just a little bit. It's a matter of taste, think, yeah. I think the problem is, is that when you listen to Holdsworth's playing, he does way more chord changes than anyone in in music actually has ever done. He does way more stuff. He's way more atonal than any jazz fusion player on earth. He's well, say he's more atonal than people who literally do twelve tone roads. Exactly. He, oh, you know, no, he's check no, out. Check he's out. No, I, Zoltan, he's no. Zoltan. Zoltan. I, Zoltan. I, he's no. Hold on. He's no Frank oh. Zappa in that regard. Right. Well, Zoltan, I know. listen to Tribal Tech and Scott Henderson Trio, and then you tell me about it. I will. And and I, I will, was going to mention Frank Zappa. Thank you. Very but obvious choice when we're I talking think, about I, the influence of jazz and prog. I think we should let my dad speak. Okay. Yeah, I know. He's been waiting, man. Yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, Pat Metheny is probably the artist that I've spent more hours in my life listening to than anybody. Right? Yeah. I mean, I can't put him on the list of the top 10 prog bands because it's not really prog, but yeah, I, I know, unfortunately. I mean, yeah. I listen to, I've listened to a fair amount of Alan Holdsworth and I, I love it, but. Pat Metheny is, I mean, as I say, I've listened to more Pat Metheny than any group, even Genesis, just because I can right. put, because I can put them on every day and put on four albums in a row. Yeah, Thank true. You. Okay. okay. I can, I, yeah, I agree with that then. Alan Holdsworth is a little bit more, uh, kind of got to be in the right mood. <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah. thing. That's the yeah, thing. You got to be in the right mood to hear a lot of notes. Yeah, that's the problem. But I think that the thing is, is that even when you're not in the right mood, I mean, his his chords and his ideas can really spark it. Yeah, but when you but, listen. but it gets boring. But, I want to hear a chord ring. You know what I mean? Sometimes I want to hear a chord ring. That's me with yeah, me uh, that's me with animals as leaders. I think that they're totally unfeeling. They're I just can't listen to animals as leaders. I just don't right. find them to I be very compelling. I think that's a pretty fair assessment, considering you listen to Holdsworth. But but Holdsworth is not as he's he's warm. Animals as leaders is actually very cold, in my honest opinion. I don't think I can get into them. There's a, no, here's a question. Here's a question for for Brian as a fellow Pat Metheny fan enthusiast, by the way. Yeah. Um, if you could give any advice for any progressive rock band that is trying to emulate some of that, not necessarily copy, but bring some of that um, Pat Metheny sound, because I composed two songs with my fellow bandmate ten years ago, that is very like Pat Metheny, Charlie Hayden inspired, and I'd say the Way Up inspired songs right inside a progressive metal rock album yeah. but i feel that i hit a kind of a, like a writer's block so to speak not because i don't know what to do specifically or creating a jazz fusion song a lot pet Matheny, yeah. but more like make a blend but in, in coming for somebody like you who i listen to your albums and your work and your recent uh thing that you sent to me about your uh, tribute to lion mace how would you suggest incorporating more of that style? See, I mean, I'm just, I've just written that piece that to me is, it's got a, it's got a huge influence of Lyle Mays, but yeah. I've never studied jazz chords in my entire life. I have right. no, I have no real clue what the heck that they're doing. It's all kind of beyond me. So I think that, uh, you know, a lot of the Pat Metheny stuff, even if you didn't know technically exactly yeah. the chords he did or what, what the theory was behind it. If you can just capture the mood. Right. 
Right. It's all because that's what Pat Metheny really is all about. Like, it, I mean, I'm not listening to a Pat Metheny album because I'm just listening to see how quick his guitar riffs are. You know, it's exactly. not that kind of thing. It's not a it's not really that you're listening to it. I mean, they are great musicians, but I would I listen to it for the mood. So it's the mood you got to capture and just whatever the core right. together. Don't even worry about what the theory really works. Yeah. I mean, if you want to be a, a world class jazz musician, then you might have to know. But if you just want to write something, I really think, again, it's just that that mood that he has that makes you. Yeah, he, he makes me. Yeah, he makes music like he, even though like they all like top notch musicians, Berkeley, classical music and name it. They understand the true purpose of music. And to be honest, Oten, I think. Even though I love Holdsworth, I think he does get very mathematical with the scales yes. and stuff. Where Pat Matheny is like, I know all that stuff. I could be just like that, but yeah, I'm going by the heart of the music. Of course. And of each course. title, each, each each title of each song by Pat Matheny or the group brings you the same, the exact feeling that the title is trying to convey. Like the song, yeah. Tell Her You Saw Me. When I listen to that song, a very simple jazz God. song. That's great. It makes you do think that you saw this girl that you had a crush years ago that oh, maybe yeah. did spark something and you say to the guy, tell her you saw me. This song does convey that mood and motion. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and then like, uh, this is like one of the reasons why I'm an enthusiast of that. And I think Ryan, Brian can agree is that the title and the mood of the song does convey exactly the emotion. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, well, I, 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 do, I, I do it. I do it. I mean, not Franka. Um, Alan, gonna... I definitely. I can sort of see where you're coming from where a lot of his titles and the, the themes of the songs are a little off putting out there. Yeah. A little off-putting. I'm going to say this. Be a little mathematical. I think I, he does have emotion though. I think he does express he's, that. He does. Very he does. emotional. He does. And I'm going to say this. I think, I think you guys have uh, convinced me that maybe Pat, Pat is my second, but I think that Holdsworth's never going to leave my top three. But just because of the fact no, that when that. when you listen to him, it doesn't sound like he. Do you think he really knows what he's doing? I mean, he probably he's he sits down and he just plays it like he feels it. He doesn't know what he's playing. He just plays it. He's a he's a genius beyond anyone. I mean, he is a musical genius who just sits down and just plays it and doesn't know what he's doing. I don't I don't actually think he wrote anything because I don't I, I think when uh, when I heard him talking in an interview, I said he's I think he said that. Doesn't even know the names of the modes. He he barely knows the no, names of these scales. He just he, plays them. He does, but he he understands scales in a different way than most people do. Exactly. He says when he he says when he sees chords, he sees scales. Of course. And he can yeah. mess with that. He can mess with a chord variation. Oh, of course. You you get a C, right? A regular C, and you do so many variations, so many freaking scales, the octatonic scale, yeah. and you you create his own. Okay, mathematical yeah. scaling. That, that's that. the thing. He's a, the Holdsworth, he, right? Holdsworth chords, Holdsworth scales. He come up with his own stuff on the spot. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. He's definitely he's like, a genius beyond us. Right. Unfortunately, I hate to say it, but I think he really is a genius beyond us. Um, I'll also go ahead water. and say this, that I think that thank, thank you very much, Thiago, for uh, bringing him up. Uh, Lyle Mays. Um, yes. has his um, you have to take into consideration that I actually sometimes listen to Pat Metheny groups just for Lyle Mays himself not even for Pat Metheny sometimes and I think Ryan you even said that too about what how you actually have listened to Pat Metheny group albums just for Lyle Mays not even Pat Metheny oh yeah for especially the first one I, I, I'm uh, yeah. I, I'm more struck by Lionel Mays than I am Athene on that one, particularly. Yeah, of course. Completely agree. He steals I, the show. Oh, yeah, for sure. There's no doubt for me that Lionel Mays is a genius as well. He's He's got the keyboard. He's got a key, He's got an idea behind the keys that just... He, when you hear him play, you're just thinking, good God, this man can really sit down and just write something without even needing to even think about what he's writing and that's what i saw out of my dad i mean when i saw him writing towards orion he just came up with it one day on the spot yeah there's no theory behind it it's just like yeah. it's completely by feel i don't even bother to know what the hell the same way yeah for sure same here now, you know, I, I know my can, theory, can, but can, 
I don't really necessarily need it in order to write a song. And when I'm no, coming oh, up no. with, yeah. with ideas and, and melodies and stuff like that, and even progressions, I don't really think about, oh, this is the one chord going to the six and then going to the, the five. Or I try, I try. Because I, I, think, right. I think if you, uh, let me just finish real quick. If, if you, if you always think about <laughs> that voice crack, nice. if you always think about, um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought, but if, if you're always thinking about theory, when you're making just even a melody or like a chord progression yeah. or something, you're going to just, it's going to be very mathematical. It's going to be very formulaic. Of I think course. pop, pop writers, not the musicians, the writers, they think, yeah, it has to go to the one and then the five and then the, the six and then the four. And the melody yeah. has to be super diatonic because that's correct. Exactly. And then the music's just boring. Whereas I want a little bit of, you know, a chord that's out there. I, I like putting my flat six in a progression. Cause it's cool. You have something that's a little out there, you know. Yeah, you might have a, a, a non-chord tone in your melody. It's cool. Some chromaticism. Just add right. It all I mean, in. atonal yeah. sections. Put it all in there. Make it interesting. The way the way I see it is this. Okay, like I try to do like half and half. Not yeah. all the time, of course. Sometimes it takes precedence depending on the song. The way I see theory is this. Not necessarily something. Yeah, I have. To obey uh -huh. is yeah. something that I have to that it has to be under my command. Yeah, I'm not gonna obsess over it. For so for most, I'm gonna go for what sounds yeah. right and good for me. Then after I write something that sounds good to me, I will have more or less the theory in my mind, but I'm not gonna pay attention. Later, I'm gonna sit down I'm like, okay, now I need to write the tab for it. Yeah, what did I do on yeah. so this song? What right? On what here? did I do? Okay, this is what I did. Yeah, that is it. Now. I want to bring you that more force to the, to the now that you're talking about to the Orion. Um, how long did, what, was it? Something like what was the process, Brian? Did you came up? Did you come up with that on the spot, or did you think about something one day and you thought I, I should write a, 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 a you know a tribute to Lyle, or it was something like on the spot you sat down, and you started like, playing it, and you're like that's my tribute. I think it's just being in the right mood with that mood on that day. Mm -hmm. And pretty much the, all those chords came together in about 10 minutes. Wow. wow. Yeah, I, just like they all just flowed one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. It was the obvious thing. And then when I thought about it from the, the theory of it, it's actually pretty simple. It's, right. It's just like what Ryan was saying. It's just the one odd note here. And the one exactly. you're not expecting, and it's got the right mood. Yeah. So I could have put 10 or 15 more chords in there, and I probably would have started to make it sound too clinical. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'd be too clever. And then it, yeah. it was the mood. So, so, that is so true. Yeah. That is so true. Very wise words. You know, I'm going to say this, um, because we've been at this for a while. I think we should oh, yeah. end at the three-hour mark. And on the dot, and I think we could probably. Oh, it's dot. only it's only it's only ten minutes away. It's about ten yeah. fifteen minutes away. It's sure, 13, no it's, problem. It's twelve and a half minutes away. So, I'm gonna say this to finish up, and hopefully you guys can give your final thoughts on that subject. Um, I think that when it comes down to it, there's a few other musicians that we haven't exactly uh given enough credit to. For example. I gave credit to Jean-Luc Ponte because, well, he's awesome. Um, <laughs> um, you have a Return to Forever, of yeah. course, that's great. But we're forgetting one other person. And Ryan, I think, I don't, I'm surprised that you didn't bring him up. George Duke. I was going to bring him up. George Duke. Well, I wasn't always, who I was going to bring up, but I, I was going to bring up Frank Zappa. Yeah. Because he is, you know, of course, he's also, he's a chief jazz rock at times he's pro full-on progressive rock at times uh yeah. and i do think that he's <clears throat> been able to bridge people from the jazz fusion to the prog rock sound he's been kind of yeah. like in the middle bridging the gap yeah and he, he you know has always had that that jazzier vibe and he's definitely influenced people you know even like dream theater mike portnoy says that frank zappa is his idol yeah. um and he's he's influenced a lot of different artists to adopt within the progressive rock sound to have very, very, very jazz leanings and adding all those, like he had horns and soprano saxes and even marimbas and just all this 
you know, different stuff. I'll bring, I will, I will bring one other person though. Can I? Go ahead. Yeah. And this is not bootlegging. It's sincere. It's a sincere thing, especially because at the beginning of this year, when things started really going down for me on a personal level, mm -hmm. and that's when I started talking to Zoltan. Yeah. And I've been telling this to people uh, because after you, Zoltan, started showing me his work, it, it gave me a lot of passion to keep going. And this is, I'm not even capping right now. Because for me, I can talk about those bands all day. I don't personally know them, right? But I have somebody here who I absorb knowledge from, and he's been one of, one of the some some of the people showed up in my life like that. But they are either not doing that anymore, or really talking much about it anymore, or they're away from me. And your dad has become that person that I personally know that I can absorb so much knowledge from when it comes to music, how his life went about the music that he created, what yeah. inspired him. And like, I, I don't know, Zoltan told you this. Uh, I think I told you this, though, too, though. I kind of took you as more of a mentor role for myself. That's why I make sure to ask you a lot of personal questions about your music. And like you said, not necessarily because of the theory, but what drives you to write, write it, you know, the process. How would you feel? Uh, and, and, and I think it's been an amazing experience since the beginning of the talk, how you brought up everything. Kind of like you gave a brief summary. You could talk for days, of course, if you wanted to. Yeah. How how yeah. how you came about, you know, playing, and how many bands you've been through, how many people been coming gone in your band, and even though life took a different turn for you in some ways, you're back at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. And my friend, my friend Josh said something completely true, even though. Um, people might misunderstand it. I showed him Benjamin Skite and the Luvian Euphonies, right? Yeah. Real listening to it. And I think even certain so, Sultana so video, he said, it's like, this is tragic, but not necessarily because it's bad music, it's amazing music. This is why it's tragic. Like, if this band got the backing they deserved, they could be right there with Marillion and Genesis. I mean, and to be honest, everybody has showed your work to so far. Whatever technicality you think it was the issue, the microphone, whatever, every single person I've shown your work, I've shown your playing so far, are blown away. Are completely blown away. And they easily think that Benjamin Scott could have been that band among those others. You know what I mean? I mean, the, the music business is just a, it's a quirky business where it is so much depends on good fortune and the luck sure. of getting the right break at the right minute and even being the right band for the right time. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if you're, just, you're just like five years out of step with where the music business is. You're, you're out of luck. <laughs> yeah. True. That is so true. I'm sure there's other great musicians out there who have written some great music. Story, yeah. Can never... I give a shout out to a band that has released one album that someone introduced me to in the seventies. They're called Kyrie Elison. They're an Austrian band. They released a, an album called The Fountain Beyond the Sunrise in the 70s. Similar mm -hmm. story, you know, this great band, very talented individuals, and no one has ever heard of them mm -hmm. at all. They're this very underground band. And I think had they done a couple more albums, they could have been on the level of a, of a Marilli. Well, not a Marillion, but like I guess they could have been a Gentle Giant in that sort right. of era, the 70s, or, or, a, or a Van der Graaff Generator. But sadly, much like you know Benjamin's kite, they've you know flown under the radar. They never got their light of, light of day, which is very sad because that album is is phenomenal. Much yeah, like true. the Benjamin's kite work. So another thing too, it seems like a minor thing, but uh, you know at the time, even back in the you know the early '90s when we were writing this stuff, you know I mean by then. I was already in my later twenties and the bass player was in his mid thirties and he was mm -hmm. married and he was having kids and Robbie, the singer started having, and all of that stuff just was people just, you don't have, unless you're going to stay single until you're 70 when, and maybe you will, I don't know, but you know, one of those things they happen in people, one or two people in the band all of a sudden get married and have kids. It's just, nobody can focus anymore. And now sure. they have to get the, the other job that they didn't really want to take, but, uh, you know what I mean? Like, so that kind of thing too, right? Like, even yeah. if you're 
plugging away at it, all of a sudden you'll find that life takes a turn and one of the guys gets married and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the man is over. Yeah. And people after six, seven years of plugging away, these guys were getting a bit older and the guys started getting, we all got married. Right. And right. we're all having kids and it's just, and it's, and it's funny because in my personal life, even though I'm, I'm not that experienced, it took a similar turn where a lot of my music playing and practicing and whatever took a, took a backseat to me making personal decisions of being in a relationship, getting married, having children. But I always looked at my guitar, or, you know, and I had a piano at the house too back then, which I left behind. I regret it. Um, I'm like, one day I'll get back to it. When I once I have the time, when things are more settled, when I reach my goals, and truth be told, if I could go back, you probably have similar regrets, way, um, but maybe you're different. I'm like, if I could spend at least ten minutes practicing that, just ten minutes playing something, just something, you know, I won't be in the rut I am right now, musically speaking. Even if I don't have an album out there, I'm talking about as a musician, me self fulfilled. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Like things. Not, not necessarily that you want to change, so to speak, Brian, but what you'd have done different in your career as a musician or maybe life in general, if you yeah. have anything anyway. In, in some ways, I kind of wish we just hadn't wasted near as much time doing this because, you know, you, you do seven, eight, nine, ten years and you realize, huh, we don't need to like put out one album and we got a bunch of demo tapes. That's not very much production for having been gigging across Canada for, mm -hmm. you know, for those years. Right. Because, and again, because, uh, you know, in the, between the late 80, mid eighties up until the band broke up in 93, you know, I always did day jobs and I worked in a, a freezer factory for five years, putting mm -hmm. on lids on freezers. That's uh we were putting a thousand lids per day. I was working 50 hour weeks when you're yeah. working 50 hour week, you come home, it's six o'clock at night. You've just been working for 10 yeah. hours. You only practice for five minutes and then you get up and repeat the next day. And so, I mean, I, one of the things that I remember very uh, uh, specifically, which right around that time, 1992, 1993, I was like, I'm 27. If I don't get the hell out of this factory, I'll be here when I'm 60. Exactly. Right. So it's just like, it is an emergency. I have to get out of here and go to university. Otherwise, I'm going to be a – and the job at uh, W.C. Woods, it sounds like, oh, you put on freezers on a lid. It's not really – that it requires a lot of strength. But, boy, was it tearing my body to pieces. I was getting all the tendonitis up my arm. My, mm -hmm. my fingers were getting numb, like I couldn't feel them. Plus, there's all these little tiny steel slivers. So in the, every yeah. weekend, you sit there for five hours with a needle, picking them out of your, your fingers, right? And it just, it was a brutal a job. I wouldn't want to be able to try and do that at age 50. It's one wow. thing doing that when you're 27, but you, yeah. right? you know, you realize you're going to be in the factory. That's, that's, that's the things that really interfere, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Those kind of life decisions, right? It's not just getting married. It's not the, the, oh, I'm going to go get married. I don't want to play no more, but. No, it's the, the job you have. Living. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and say this as my closing thoughts. And everyone can give their individual clothing, clo clothing, closing thoughts. Considering we only have two minutes left, um, I very much enjoyed this. I enjoyed having my dad on on this episode of Talking Prog. Dad, what did you think? Mm -hmm. What are your clo closing that thoughts? That was a lot of fun, guys. And if, if the time flew by, it was a great conversation. I it really awesome. totally Thanks flew for by. Me, Everything just flew right by and it, it almost yeah, felt like it, did. it was just we were like rambling wow. about those favorite bands for hours. Oh, I know. Thiago. <laughs> it was not just Thiago. Oh well, all of us collectively, but yeah. you know, I'm just, I'm just. It just shows how much we random. love music. It does. We are big music fanatics. We love music, and you know what? Time flies when we talk about it. So, I guess that and, that's and, you know, and just like the genre we're playing. Our podcast hey, is long winded. Yeah. Hey um, guys, so uh, all right. My final thoughts are this. I first and foremost I want to thank Brian for taking the time. I'm actually spending with us on three hours. I mean, wow. Yeah, man. I was surprised we even spent an hour to be honest with you, and you're gonna be gone. <laughs> um, but yeah. once again, thank you so much for your knowledge, for your wisdom, for what you did for music on your end, anyways. 
and what you mean to me as a musician, as a man, as a person, uh, your son as well, Zoltan, and by extension, Ryan, I think I said this in the first episode as well. Um, you guys definitely lit up more of a the path for me, for me to keep going. And that's all I have to say. And thanks for the chat. Thanks for the time. Anytime you're welcome, by the way. Of course, you. Yes, of course. Mentor, you got you to gotta show up whenever you want. All right? Feel free. Yeah. All right. So um, I think that that is a really great uh, way to end okay. off the episode. Um, Ryan, did you have anything that you wanted to say? No, I think I think Diago said it all. I think Diago said it all too. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, right, do the outro. Right. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys enjoyed this, please leave a like, share, and subscribe for Thanks. another episode of Talking Prague. Prague. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. And all right. Wow. That was really great. I really enjoyed that one. Hours. That was so great. Man. Shit. Um, People are like, you guys are crazy. Three hours. I'm like, yeah, as long as I'm driving Budokan. Shut